This is the New York City Board of Standards and Appeals Public Review Session for December 9th, 2019. We'll begin with the appeals calendar. Item number 1, 6713A, 945 Zorega Avenue, the Bronx. Okay, so um, this is actually the rehear and not the request to rehear. The request to rehear was decided in favor in March. Uh, so, and um, I'm not, in terms of procedure, I mean, I could just reread the notes that I, that we had from the last time, but basically it's a conversation of the same issues that we discussed during the rehearing, which was that DOB um, introduced new uh, evidence that wasn't available when we decided the case initially uh, in 2016. Um, the court wasn't aware of that evidence either because they remanded um, the case to us twice, actually. The first time saying um, you hadn't uh, you hadn't considered the lease as a way of establishing the existence of the sign pre-1979 the way you had on another case. And you needed to consider the lease. And so we um, looked at the case that first on the first remand. And we said, well, we're, we're looking at the facts, but the facts are very different than in that first case because the, 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 the um, commissioner of the Department of Buildings close to the time of the establishment of that first sign had signed off on the establishment of the sign. Whereas there was only a submission much later, um, there, there wasn't anything that was contemporaneous that established the sign. And so we said to the court, well, it's actually a different set of facts. We can't find establishment. And the court did not agree. And so it, re it remanded again and said to us, nothing to discuss, the sign existence in 1979 is established. Move on to whether there was continuity. And so we then had another case, another hearing on the subject of continuity following the court's instructions. And we found that there wasn't continuous use. So then, um, based on other information we found about um, the later leases, and so, and then the court remanded and said, you need to use the facts in a different case that was actually brought to the court and hadn't been heard by us. And we again distinguished that continuity um, in, in another case um, by saying that um, we had found other information that indicated that the sign had been discontinued and that the case that the court raised as the example um, didn't work also at another case that was almost identical to the facts in this case that had to do with, um, with a lease for um, an avid for, for an accessory sign that basically discontinued the advertising use. So that case then was remanded to us again. Um, and we, we looked again now, though, we could accept DOB's um, uh, new information, so those signs, uh, those photographs of the signs. Um, and we, we felt we sort of blended in the information on those signs into the question of continuity and, and found that in addition to everything else we believed, those photographs established that the signs have not been there, so um, there was no continuity. So that's an independent review on that case on remand. So now we're in the, the uh, rehearing of establishment. So um, we don't know how the court is going to be viewing the, the remand case. Um, but here we are in the subject of establishment, and those photographs for me, established that the sign wasn't present at the time that it needed to be in 1979. And the only thing that we've ever had to go on 
to in support of the applicant's argument for establishment <coughs> really has been in order by the court, consider it established, and then saying, okay, maybe those really fuzzy photographs that are of a t a tax photographs taken of a completely unrelated building where there's this little blob in the distance that you blow up and blow up, maybe that's the sign. That's kind of the only thing we've had to go on visually, right? And other than there's that lease, but there's no way to know whether the sign was installed at the time based on that lease. So from my perspective, um, the DOT photographs are conclusive that the sign didn't exist in 1979 when it needed to have, and also, you know, going forward, but we already decided that on, on a prior decision, um, it also established that the sign was discontinued once it did exist. It was discontinued at some point, or maybe it never existed. There's no way to really know, but that it didn't exist um, after the establishment date either. Anybody? Um, I agree with you, uh, Chair, um, in terms of the establish, uh, this is a new evidence we have not seen in the past. Do you be using this source for other sign cases? And when they did recognize that this source was available, they immediately used that source for this case. So, and we have only seen it for cases that have been before us for 2019, not for before. So this is really a new evidence for all sign cases that DOB is using diligently. So that's one thing I would say that this is a new evidence from my perspective. Um, the other part, as you stated, the documents clearly show that the, the, there were no sign or a sign structure as of uh, the establishment date, which is November 1st, 1979, based on the photos that were provided back in 1978. And also there was no sign or a sign structure after that, which was uh, based on a photo that was provided dated June 18, 1981. So even if, let's say, a sign was missing, the sign structure at least should have been there. Sign structure also was not there. So it's not that easy to take a sign down and move a sign up, uh, or, or especially the sign structure. So to me, the, those documents are very clear in stating that there was not a sign. And I agree with you, those very fuzzy photos that were provided, even if it was there some time ago, we don't know what the dimension of those sign structures were. They could have been much smaller, and what the sign structures um, have been depicted by the DOT photos are much larger, or, or at least of a different dimension. So it definitely goes to show there has not been a continuity. If there was any, which I doubt, and because the photos are very clear that there was none before 70, uh, November 1st, 1979, and there wasn't any after 1979, uh, November 1st, 1979. I agree with um, the chair and the vice chair. I think that the evidence, the five New York State DOT photos were very persuasive for me, that there was no sign in existence on the threshold date of November 1st, 1979. And I just want to add one thing about the Department of Finance photos that were presented as evidence of the sign. I agree with you. Those photos were very fuzzy and they were taken at a distance and it was very hard to tell whether or not it was actually the subject sign that were in those photos, but also the date on those photos could not be pinpointed to the establishment right. date because yes. those Department of Finance photos were taken at some point in the 1980s, which was right. afterwards. So when you're comparing both sets of photos, these photos are much clearer and they clearly show that sign, the subject sign, or the absence of that subject sign because they're taken at a fixed point on the highway that is equal to where that sign was in existence. So I would say that these photos are much clear evidence of the non-existence of the sign on the threshold date or for the period after the threshold date up until, I believe, 1990. Right, right. I, I totally agree with all of you. Um, the no argument, the argument by the DOB is, is very convincing to me. Uh, the no photos or the photos that they obtained from the state DOT are, are crystal clear. And I want to point out to the uh, the feedback that we got from the owner. He's, he's blaming the, D, the DOB action for not uh, doing the due diligence previously. I, I think we should be thankful to the DOB because they didn't. We 
they just put in some time. I believe that was done in good faith uh, from the DOB. But this is, for me, this is like somebody who's driving on a highway at a higher than speed limit, and then he got, he, he was in court, and then he got an accident. And then after the accident, they performed some investigation, and they concluded that, oh, you were speeding. And, and, and he was like, oh, but you didn't touch me. So I, I leave the argument is kind of weird, very weird, I would say, for me, and, and should be, like, not relied upon by the board. I think there's a little question that the five uh, DOT photos are the most probative evidence uh, presented in this case. They are the most relevant. Uh, with regard to the loan to finance photos, the blowing up of a photo distorts the size and shape of whatever objects you're seeking to look at. And short of there being any scientific evidence presented with it by a certification that these sizes or this type of blowing up creates this type of object and this is uh, accurately descriptive and at this distance, that's not probative in any event. And it can't be relied on. Uh, I want to pick up on something that Commissioner Shetta said. I mean, if this document, if this, yes. this, uh, state DOT photograph was available, then the applicant could have also made yeah. made itself available exactly. to prove their point, which they did make. Yeah. So I think pretty much no one in this room knew. The fact that it was there doesn't mean, therefore, it's an evidence that anybody could use. The fact that we did not know there was something like this available yeah. is critical. So, uh, and apparently, um, to that point, what DOB told us was they were they didn't know about the photographs until 2017, which was after a 2016 decision, and they learned about them in a DOT meeting um, in 2017. So, they, you know, th this kind of thing often happens with us. We we have meetings with an agency, and they tell us about something, and and well, I had no idea that you guys do this thing. So um, it, it wasn't apparently common information that, that they regularly, whatever it was, every three to five years take a photograph of those pinpoints. And um, I, I want to say that uh, for our council, um, when, we were just, when we were looking at whether or not to rehear the case, we did go through um, an elaborate discussion about why we were agreeing to accept the new information. And I, I don't know that I need to repeat it because it's in the transcript. Maybe we just incorporate the transcript of the rehearing um, into this um, hearing because we talked about, you know, had had DOB known about it, they would have introduced it in 2016, and had they, or even before that, because this case has been remanded so many times, and had the applicant known, the um, owner known about it, it would have looked deeply into the records, and maybe it would have found better information, or so on. So to say that uh, DOB somehow held it, held it to, for a sort of final showing, um, it's it, kind of illogical because DOB has better things to do than keep coming here for remands and, and so on. So I, I think there's that. The other thing that I do want to bring up is the owner submitted um, late, and it's not, his, not really their fault because DOB submitted very late in response, right? Um, uh, a letter uh, indicating, first of all, that we didn't have, the board doesn't have the authority to rehear a case that um, is in a state of being considered by a court. The rehearing question is not before the court. The Article 78 was the remand case, which asked us to look at continuity in light of other cases that were raised. We, we did that, and we didn't, um, and so it wasn't a rehearing of that remand case. This is a rehearing of the establishment case, which is no longer before the court. And so um, uh, they cite to a, uh, let's see, yeah, 200 West 79th was the case that it was cited to that stands for the proposition that while an Article 78 is pending on the decision, BSA doesn't have the authority to reopen the case before the court decides. But that's not the case here where we're talking about a rehearing on establishment. Um, other cases were brought up about um, 
whether was which really should have been brought up during the discussion about the we hear and whether we could take any evidence. But um, all of that is distinguishable, um, and um, I'm not sure that I should go into how to distinguish it here. Okay. I would just note that they have filed an Article 78 on the March decision, and so to the extent that the cases are distinguishable, the law department can set uh, that forth in our papers as well. Okay, okay. So, but, there, so, uh, but just to sort of, uh, to, to summarize, the, the situations where evidence was not admitted by the court or the court decided that the evidence was available are all very different situations than here. Um, and uh, for instance, there's Collins v. Rochester, which is really a kind of an antique of a case. It's almost a 100-year-old case, um, which had to do with admitting um, evidence about the relationship of a nurse to the decedent to um, actually uh, changes the will so that all the money goes to the nurse, it sounds like something, a movie I just saw, right? And, um, and the, the argument comes in that the family, after the court decides to uphold the, the will, um, the family comes back and says, oh, the nurse coerced him. And she was she was bad, and the court argued that well, actually, the family knew the nurse very well and would have known that information before, so should have raised it then. So that was barred, and so most of the cases are that type and easily distinguishable from our situation. I think this is an attempt to get a second bite at the apple. Uh, during the rehearing, we we spoke at great length about the admissibility of this evidence. Uh, we, availability and the evidentiary value of this evidence and the preference that the courts have to decide a case on the merits as opposed to a technicality. Yes. Um, yes. Which is actually one of the cited cases, the higher case, yep. where the court says we prefer to hear the cases on their merits and so wouldn't bar um, information that wasn't available before. I, I believe we did cite uh, at least I believe I cited many of those cases uh, during our rehearing review. Okay. Uh, and, and if mm -hmm. not, we should put that into the resolution, uh, some of the cases into the resolution. Right. So we're going to incorporate the transcript from the rehearing, um, the request for the rehearing. Request for rehearing. And, and this is the rehearing, so that we'll pick up on all of that. Um, and one of the reasons that I wanted to mention this in the owner's letter is the owner is no longer represented by counsel, so I wanted them to be, so they're appearing kind of pro se in this, and I wanted them to be able to have at least an opportunity to have to be heard, um, absent the presence of counsel. So, okay. On that, on that note, I just want to say that this owner is a, a uh, seasoned business person with a great deal of experience. Yes. May I move on? Mm -hmm. yeah. Item number two, continued hearings, 2017, sorry, 2017, 310A, 1002 Farragut Road, Brooklyn. <coughs> okay, so this is, this was, um, DOB requested an adjournment uh, on this, uh, uh, ultimately a request to modify the CFO for the, uh, the um, medical waste transfer facility, right? But then um, Friday afternoon, late, we got an email from the owner's representative saying that um, they disagreed with owner or DOB's characterization of how the CFO should be modified. They don't want to file the PW7 form, and they don't want to submit to a, the standard kind of inspection that you do when you get a CFO. And so it sounds actually like the owner is not cooperating with DOB, which was sort of our understanding here. We decided that we we would um, hold off, in fact, we adjourned every one of the hearings that had to do with deciding on the modification of the CFO because it was our understanding that the owner would cooperate with DOB and modify the CFO as required um, voluntarily. So my feeling about it is now that if owner is um, sort of standing on ceremony, which it seems like mostly they're objecting 
to an inspection. I find that odd because every agency imaginable already inspected this site. Agencies that don't come to the site under normal CO inspection situations, um, DEP went, fire department went, Department of Buildings went, um, we went, I mean, everyone was there, right? And in fact, work did need to be done because they needed to construct that wall that separated the one use from the other. Um, and so I'm quite confused about their reluctance to just have a DOB inspector walk around with basically a very simple building um, and, just, and just check it out. So I would say either it, perhaps um, we shouldn't adjourn this, and we have oh, the person from DOB. Okay, yeah, and we have a representative from DOB. Um, so maybe DOB should attend tomorrow, and the owner should attend tomorrow, and we work this out. Or I'd recommend that we we vote on this uh, application to modify the CO and direct the CO to be modified as we discussed because it wasn't the owner is saying oh it's use group 16 and it's just a technicality that I changed the, the description but for us it wasn't a technicality at all we were saying we don't know really what this is in use group 16 we'll just leave it as use group 16 and clarify on the description which you often get to do what goes on here and what's not allowed to go on here. And that way, it will make it clear to future comers what, what's supposed to happen at this site. Because we didn't want to create a new use group that which we shouldn't do, right? Um, so that's my recommendation. Anybody else on that? Special order calendar, item number 3, 863-48-BZ, 259-16, Union Gym by Queens. Okay. Okay. Um. Sorry. Okay, so based on photos, the site looks a little better, um, but the but the mixed brick block and stucco wall was painted instead of stuccoed, and it should have been stuccoed, which is what we discussed at that hearing, and then painted. So the owner just sort of went in with a can of red paint, a kind of brick color paint in his defense. I know he was eager to do that because he thought that that's all he needed to do, but it really looks pretty terrible. And it's white, I think, on one side. Um, and now we learn from the submission that the tenant's lease expires in September, and he doesn't want to spend the money, which I understand, because if he's moving out, is he moving out, or is he doing, you know? Um, he doesn't want to spend the money to repair the broken asphalt and sidewalk. But I have to say, it's the owner, and not the tenant's responsibility to maintain the site, ultimately. And the owner, in fact, is um, uh, Mr. Duarte's client, um, who authorized the uh, application and so on. So I think the owner has to appear at these hearings, and it really should never be just the tenant, because it gives the owner the opportunity to kind of just avoid its responsibility. Um, and how it, the owner works it with the, between the tenant is a different subject that's outside of our domain, but it, it is the owner's job to maintain the site or lose the right to have this variance, right? And um, we have actually exercised that not too long ago with one owner who refused to maintain their site. So, other comments on this? So maybe another site visit would be worth it, but I just, from the photos, I'm like... Uh, so you want the owner tomorrow? The owner needs to come tomorrow, yeah. Okay. So just email the wording. I have one question um, the applicant has stated that the tire racks have been dismantled and removed from the site. Does that mean there won't be any use of it in future? I mean, given that we don't know whether the lease is going to be removed or not, but it's not something that gets removed and totally and gets put back again. I bet you it has to be within the building. Yes. Um, and so that was just a... Uh, it's not a question. It's they have to be stored inside the building. It's not a, an option. Right. Yeah, I think they mentioned something about storing, if they have tires, they will store them inside the building. So I would ask for interior photos showing where these tires would be stored. Mm -hmm. Okay. And the land? 
landscaping and the planters outside of the brick wall are not going to survive the winter. Mm -hmm. okay. The only thing I would add is uh, with regard to the sidewalk, it seems that the, the suggestion that the board stipulate this condition prior to the issuance of the final certificate of occupancy feels to me that they're just not planning to do the work at all. Right. Well, we know. Right. And the photos for the tire legs, the interior photos for the tire legs, I, I believe if they, if they remove the tire legs from outside in both phase and they said they're going to handle tire work, they should be ready as of tomorrow. They should get us these photos tomorrow. Yes. Because they should have installed this. They should have moved the inside. Yes. Right. Yeah. I mean, whether they put them on racks or put them, <laughs> back them up in a well, stack, who yes. cares, right? But they need to be kept inside. Um, yes. Right. It's kind of like, I, I get that the tenant doesn't want to spend the money, um, and that's why we need to move to the owner, because we often have a situation where the tenant can't spend the money, and the owner is irresponsible, and so then what do you do? And we didn't get any update on the trash enclosure right now from this little submission. No. at the last meeting for trash enclosure. Mm -hmm. We had questioned both that the trash enclosure and the tire yes. At the last hearing, we had said that the trash enclosure and tire racks were outside the building and they needed to be enclosed. Mm -hmm. Number four, 1715-61-BZ, 12902 Guy Boulevard, Queens. Right, and we just got a, another submission. I think it was a photograph of the front of the building. We just got that. Um, so uh, they provided BSA 2010 drawings. Um, I think that they did that because I was concerned about the exhaust. Um, exhausting to the sidewalk. They show the same fans that are directing it to the sidewalk. I think our resolution should say that we take no position on the legality. Um, I looked up the violations and there are boiler violations and these fans are in the boiler room, I think. Um, and the boiler violations are related to something called blow down valves. I don't know if that has anything to do with this. Um, but I just want to make sure that it's clear that we don't sort of infer that we're approving these fans. Um, uh, in terms of establishment of continuous use, they provided W-2s, which is where more information than probably we should have. Um, but they're from uh, since June of 2017 when the CO expired, and it shows the address of the business and the payment of the employee who works for the business. And um, they submitted another drawing to show that the fence that was on off the property line was removed, mm -hmm. or will be removed, or yes. no, actually is removed because there's a photograph. Yeah. And right, okay. Anybody else on this one? No, no just just we, we got the submission for for this product without any cover letter. So yeah. just in case if they get to work with us. In the future, they have to provide a cover letter yes. explaining what they submit. Because sometimes when reviewing cases, this cover letter help us track if there is something missing or something. Maybe I can clarify. Um, the, when we got the last set of submission, at that time, um, I felt like there were five parking lots. And um, as a drawing showed four, and um, the project manager had reached out to the applicant to clarify whether there were four or five, and based on that, they submitted revised photos to indicate that there were actually oh. four uh, parking spaces and not five. And I think they removed the fifth parking space because that was partially on their property and partially on City Street. Okay, that's the reason we got that photo. Yeah. Just yeah, I'm, I'm talking about He's talking about a cover letter. letter. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. The cover letter for, yeah. Yeah. Oh. for the originals. Of right. Yeah, so this is for the benefit of this particular applicant if 
um, they appear here again, all submissions have to be accompanied by a cover letter that explains why you're submitting the material. Yeah. Item number five, 17193BZ, 3245 75th Street, Queens. Okay, we uh, needed proof of continuous use since 2014. They submitted Google Street View images, which is the new preferred <laughs> and easy approach if you know how to use that. Um, it's like the time machine on Google. Um, and it's, it covers each year, plus they also provided Con Edison bills that show usage. So you see a picture of the place and you see they used electricity, so it means the place was open. Um, the statement of facts also discusses briefly the substantial prejudice that the owner would suffer if the use were required to be discontinued. Um, brief, but you know, the business has been there for 25 years. Fire department submitted uh, November 30th um, um, letter of no objection stating that the parking stackers have been removed. So um, in other words, that they removed their objection on that. Um, the photos were provided. Um, I think all the signs and banners that we see are on the adjacent property. Not, not the northern flags, but the signs and banners. Um, so not part of this application. So I thought the site looks clean with respect to that. There were two sets of drawings provided, one of which is titled in the foldable folder bubble, but I didn't actually find any bubbles. Um, signage drawings were perhaps improved. I can't really tell. Um, though, but they're still minuscule, so you have to zero in and zero in and zero in before you can see that it's actually a sign and not a blob. I don't actually don't understand that concept of a submission. Um, this is, you know what this comes from? It comes from the architect working on CAD and working in really, really close detail and then never printing the drawings. So they don't realize that you can't see anything. Um, so I'm not sure whether there, there'll be an issue when they print them for our record, um, because it's just going to come out as blobs when it's uh, 11 by 17. Um, copy that. So the, also the drawings needed to have shown signage calculations to show compliance with the C1 regs, and they, they, they didn't provide that. Um, and, but most of the signs are things like no parking signs. And um, I'm not sure about the word customer parking, but no parking signs and, you know, tow-away zone or those kinds of things, I, I'm not sure that DOB counts those towards the area of a sign. That's not been my experience when I applied to DOB. Um, so, uh, but we don't have any calculations. There are two big signs that say customer parking, and those probably do count because they're about the customer. Um, and the applicant needs to uh, provide a copy of the applications for street tree installation because that way at least we'll know we're getting some street trees, which we were supposed to have gotten the last time and never got. And now I don't want to make that a condition because I'm afraid they'll just never do it. So if at least they apply, then we see they've applied. Anybody? Oh. Yeah, are you I, I, real quick, I, I visited this site on Thursday, and I, I would say the site is immaculate. It's beautiful. I love, I love it. <laughs> but I stayed here for about five minutes, and before I leave, actually, I, I drove my car, and I started moving, and all of a sudden, I saw somebody's parking on the sidewalk. Uh-oh. So I parked my car again, and I went back, and I looked at the car. It doesn't have plates, front plates. And then I went inside to the front desk and I spoke to the guys. The first guy I spoke to was like, this is not our car. I said, listen, this is not in favor of your business. If, if you want to keep operational, you, you need to maintain discipline on the side. So he promised that he's going to resolve this, but I'm not sure. I'll leave it to the board. If you want to bring in the operator or the owner, yeah. we, we could do that. So. What I can't remember without looking at the drawings is whether there are signs on the fence that say it no sign, parking. Yeah. Yes, it's actually that, that whoever parked at this car, I have, I have. He parked right in front of the sign that says no yes. parking on the side. Right next to the sign, yes. <laughs> that's, that's a lot of brass. <laughs> 
Yep, it's just right there. No yep. parking on the sidewalk. That's hysterical or not hysterical. <laughs> It's like, it's like what do you do work. other than yeah, the like tire and open on the sidewalk? Yeah, the sidewalk. Side, side yeah. yeah. I, I guess we need to bring in the operator because otherwise, if nobody's taking responsibility for this, yeah. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. New case is item number 6, 764-56-BZ, 200-05, corresponding expressway claims postponed. All right. We wanted to postpone it and didn't feel like it was ready with the application. Yeah, I, I, for their benefit, I just want to say that the site plans they submitted are not legible. Oh. If we can, least, I live there, so mm -hmm. if we can, like, resubmit them, that would save them some time. Okay, okay. Item number 7751-78-BZ-200-15, Northern Boulevard, Queens. Okay. Um, we, we did get um, proof of notice of hearing as an email, but it, was, it never made it into SharePoint, so please make sure that it's in SharePoint. Um, we have proof of service of initial application to officials and community board recommends conditional approval, and I'll read what they say. They voted resulting in 33 in favor and five in opposition to recommend the application for approval for a 10-year term with the conditions that all four clothing bins should be removed from the site, no vehicles parked on site sidewalks, the site should remain clean and free of debris, free of graffiti, any lighting should be directed away from the residences, Increases increase the size of dumpster or enclose a dumpster site, and all prior conditions remain. Um, and I just want to pick up on that thought that the, the photographs show tires being stored outside that cannot, um, cannot be, and the cars cannot be parked on the grass, which is something that I saw, or the sidewalk in front of or behind the building. Um, so there's, there's a grassy area which I think is off the property line, um, but it kind of looks like it's on the property line and there are cars parked on that grassy area. Um, also, no, there's also a storage container, like a, you know, a classic storage container um, that's on the site and it, it's either not permitted or it has to be behind a fence the enclosure. Before, in this yes. case, and yes. we allowed them to keep it provided they painted it in a nice oh. color and then we went through that oh, okay. and he made it burgundy and thought that matched nicely and it, well, yeah. he tried. He tried. <laughs> oh, okay. All right. Sorry. But so I think because we also don't have the dumpsters in an enclosure, maybe what the best solution is to put the whole thing behind an enclosure. Um, and just so you've got your storage and you've got your dumpster all in one place. Otherwise, it's like a site, a little site scattered with all of this stuff. Um, and, um, and I just want to say it's funny how the compliance form that is submitted and signed by the applicant, who I think is also a lawyer, therefore certifying, doesn't mention the presence of tires stored outside, although that was an expressed issue at the last resolution and a condition. Okay. In fact, the statement of facts states that there are no st tires stored outside but the applicant's own photos. So that wasn't from the dated Google image, that was their own photo show, the tire stored outside. They followed up saying that they're only stored outside during business hours. Right. And that they're, they're not permanent racks and that they go back and say, I haven't been there after business hours. I, Why is it okay to store them outside during business hours? You attract attention. Yeah. Yeah. Attract attention. It's called a sign. Well, he has he has trouble here precisely because his site is so it's small right. and yes. his building is small. And that was what he said when he was here the first time: is that he's having trouble doing the work in the building with all these different things in the building and also finding a place for storage. So he kind of has challenges. Which yeah, I, find a I can understand because it's like kind of an odd shape. It's right. a triangle kind. of. But so this goes back to the being inefficient about how you lay out your site, right? If we had an enclosure and you put the storage container and the dumpster and the tires in the enclosure, then they're all in one place and they're not sort of haphazardly 
stored, right? I mean, you're not creating a building, which arguably you're not allowed to do anymore on this site because it's limited, right? So maybe that's the way to do it. Calculate how big the enclosure needs to be and, and do a fencing so it's organized. Otherwise, it's just a little here and there, right? Plus the, um, I don't remember that we permitted the clothes bins before. No, the clothes bins have well. been, they are, they've been removed since the community board complained. They have removed it and they provided oh. those photos later on. They were the response of the community um, board's right. I, I feel I agree with Commissioner O.P. Brown. The site is very irregular and it is narrow. So um, I think uh, trying to operate there during business hours at and storing them off the business. I think what they're doing is storing everything within the building on business hours and during business hours, take them out so that they can use this space for auto repair. And the rest of the space is really for storing of those vehicles that are awaiting repair or waiting for pickup. So there is very little space, even if they were to widen the enclosed area where the um, the trash enclosure and other things, but it's for them to tell that to us. Uh, but I think there is a difficulty. But I mean, I think that for, if you look the way a container is, it's a very, on a site shape like this, a big rectangle isn't the most practical shape for storage. So what ends up happening is there are these sort of dead corners and triangles around it, right? If you put that in a place and then you put a fence around it, now you have room in there to store, store things in an organized fashion that's not haphazard. That's kind of what I'm saying, you know? It it's actually will look better, it'll give them official places to put stuff, and, um, and it won't be an eyesore. So um, I, I actually think it, it could work without, and, and would be, because we, we don't have the dumpster, we don't want the dumpster just sitting around outside either, right? So. Also, we need to provide a lumen study. Um, okay. Item number eight, 6414 BC. I'm sorry, Tony. I'm sorry. Yeah, You're yeah. going back to 751 yeah. 78 BC. Yeah, for, for the um, tire rack, the, I, I understand it was removed from outside. Now, they said they're going like, to temporarily store the tires during business hours outside. Yeah. I'm okay with that, but when they move them in, we need to see the storage place in picture. So they need to submit again for the Yeah, but I just talked about, yeah, we, just, we just talked about an enclosure where they would keep everything. And so there's no reason why they would, there's no reason to keep the tires out. So I get while they're moving them in and moving them out. It's a pain, right? How often do you actually need to go get go for a tire, right? So if they put them in a storage enclosure where the dumpster is and where there's a big storage container already on the site, which probably also has tires in it, you know, or it has in it, um, or other kinds of repair equipment, right? There's also a big container in the corner. Yes, I understand. I apologize. Yeah. I didn't pay attention to that. But if they already have something inside and they want to stay with it, if they move the rack, if the rack's no, inside... No, but what I'm trying to say is I don't want to see the racks outside. No, no. I'm not, I'm, not saying, I'm not saying outside. If they move them inside and they want to stay with the inside scenario, they need to... Right, yes. but they can't work inside. They have to take them out because otherwise they can't pull the cars in. That's what they're saying. They, they pull the car in, they park the car, and then they pull the racks in at night. So the cars are either parked awaiting service in the lot, or they finish working on them so it's empty on inside. But they don't have room to have the tire rack inside at the same time as the cars inside, apparently. That's my understanding. Maybe it's different, but whatever. Okay. Because then there's no way to work around the car, right? The guys have to be able to move equipment around the car and all that. So and the tires are in the way. I go to the tire stores all the time and you have the racks inside and when I go to the side, the car is outside and they change the tire. They, they go inside, grab one of the tires and then put it outside, install it outside. And that's supposed to, you're supposed to be working inside. Uh -huh. uh -huh. <laughs> so. <laughs> 
Item number eight, 6414BZ, 1320 East 23rd Street, Brooklyn. Oops. Uh, okay. Um, there are no notice requirements for extensions of time to complete. Um, this special permit was issued in August 2015. Um, nothing has been done, no permits pulled. There's an existing stock work order for a legal rear yard construction that's dated from 1989, and you can see what it is. Um, it's a two-story structure. Um, I note that the resolution incorrect, uh, our resolution incorrectly permitted the total side yard width to be reduced below the required 13 feet to 10 foot 9 feet, which is not within the board's authority. So that's an error in the grant. Um, and that far more, in the, looking at the drawings, far more than 50% of the exterior walls, that's something like 80% of the exterior walls, are being removed to enable this enlargement, effectively a complete demolition. So that's inconsistent with the view that has been developed over the last five years of the authority the board has to allow these special permits. So in my opinion, it's saying no, the permit has expired and the applicant should apply for a new one that complies with our standards. Anything else? Um, I just want to uh, a little bit more information as to what they meant by our financial constraints. Just a blanket statement saying there's finite. They made a blanket statement saying there's financial constraints without anything uh, to support that. I just wanted to know what, what the financial constraints were about. And we didn't even file for a, a, a permit. They didn't hire the architect to continue the work. So it's it obviously no, they sort of, it's almost borderline abandoning because they need no efforts as far as anything is available on online anyway. So. Did they submit a timeline for completing? No. It wasn't anything that they Too short. Too short. Item number 9, 2017-207-BZ, 2030 Broadway, Manhattan. Okay. Um, there are no uh, notice requirements for extensions of time to obtain a CO. The statement of fact speaks of the PCE in the future tense, but this was a legalization, so they need to clarify that. I think they just resurrected their old application. Um, given that this is a PCE in a mixed-use building with residents above and assuming that it's operating, which it is, um, I think the neighbors should be notified of the hearing. Although, it's a yoga studio, and um, you know, you could argue yoga studios are quiet, but they're really not. <laughs> so it's, if it's not well insulated, um, it, it could be annoying when people are doing headstands and slamming their feet up against the walls, et cetera. So um, applicants should verify that the ownership hours, operation, sprinklers, and occupancy of the PCE are the same as they were when the PCE was approved. Um, fire department may want to look, I don't know. Um, because this is a tenant in a large building, I'd like to understand whether it's actually reasonable to expect this CFO in, in one year or, in fact, in almost any year, or whether instead something like um, uh, Mr. Steinhaus and I discussed this, something like a letter of no objection might be obtained from DOB. Um, I see on this site st a stop work order issued against the property for a completely unrelated site and many open ECB violation and, and open um, job applications, alteration applications. So that indicates no CO any time in the near or probably distant future. And so I don't want them to have to keep coming back here every year. Um, so maybe there's something we could talk about with DOB issuing just a, we're, we're good, you don't, you know, if you could have amended the CO, we'd be good with this use. With the violations of the insurance of the TCO? Yes. Oh yeah, well there's a stop work order on one of them spaces and many ECB violations and I don't know to what they refer and like a hundred open applications so you don't get a TCO with that. Okay. A P 
appeals calendar, new cases, item number 10, 2018-198A, 85 Trenton Court, Staten Island. Okay, we have proof of service of initial application and of notice of hearing to officials. Community board recommends disapproval with one to approve, and they state, quote, tandem parking for two-family dwelling while permitted is not acceptable to board three because it causes the tenants to use on-street on parking, creating problems for the neighborhood. Trenton Court is paved, but from the plan submitted, it appears the improved street widths range from 25 feet to 27 feet, and is a dead end. Trenton Court is a substandard width and dead end that is not appropriate for on-street parking. Um, uh, I'd like the, uh, the applicant to clarify whether Hanover Avenue and Durenzo Court are mapped or CCO streets. The houses that have access to Trenton Court have frontage on those streets. So I don't think that um, the site would have qualified under GCL 36.3, even if Trenton were a CCO street, which is a statement that the applicant made. If it had been CCO, because this is not a CCO street, but apparently title is vested in the city, which is pretty confusing. Mm -hmm. um, the self-certified builder's pavement plan is very odd, and I say self-certified because it obviously was not reviewed by anyone. Um, it pulls the sidewalk forward of the property line, so that there's a real sidewalk with planting, you know, planting strip and so on, and it but it aligns with no sidewalk at all from Hanover. It just juts out into the street. The road that it creates is irregular and really not passable. Um, Trenton really should be connecting up to, to Dorenzo, um, which is now like a towpath instead of an actual street. Um, the, the connection right now is a towpath. I think the the builder's pavement plan is really haphazard, and that's exactly what is the problem on Staten Island, is this haphazard whatever. It's almost like something you would find in, a, in farm country. Um, I would want DOT to review the builder's pavement plan. Um, there is a 2016 city planning approval for school seats and future subdivision under section 107-08 of the zoning resolution. Um, those two um, decisions look at tree retention and topography. Um, we should get a copy of what DCP approved, but the approval states clearly that no review of GCL 36 issues um, was conducted, so, this, so uh, they didn't look at the streets um, as part of the application. There's also a DEC freshwater wetlands permit, but no related drawings, though I see there's a kind of little area at the back of the site that's supposed to be the no-touch zone. Um, the fire department really needs to be involved in this. We don't have something from them. Community board, I think, really has a point about on-street parking in this location. Um, I don't even really know how you turn your car to get into the driveway um, because the builder's pavement plan always says the owner only has to pave to 50%, you know, to the middle of the street. So by paving to the 50%, you get something that is completely bizarre. Um, the survey also doesn't indicate that the city has title to the whole with the trip in court in front of the proposed lot. So it's really not clear at all what is vested in the city and what's private property with respect to that part of the, that rear portion of Trenton Court. Anybody else? Um, I, I would like to, uh, FDNY to kind of give us some direction in terms of whether the work of the, um, the Trenton Court would be adequate in terms of their ability to uh, address the safety factor. That's uh, my primary concern. With regards to the cars being parked on the sidewalk, there are not the sidewalk, on the, sorry, it's on the on the street. Um, there are four buildings that have uh, that are facing, I wouldn't say frontage, that have that face the Trenton Court, and all, uh, including the proposed building, there would be four that would face Trenton, and of all the four. Three of them have frontage on other streets, and their primary access is from these other streets. This is the only building that would have access from Trenton Court. Um, I think it would be minimal in terms of the issue that is being raised. The only 
think that would be of concern with that would it impede FDNY's ability to provide um, um, to, to be able to access uh, when there's an emergency situation? Um, that's really my primary concern on that. Okay. Chair and Vice Chair, I just wanted uh, a little more information on the history of this lot's formation and whether it was owned in common with adjacent lots or not. No, it's very clear. It was owned in common with the lot 15. There's a 150. On yes, it's a 150 foot lot, and they applied for a subdivision approval to make it a 100 foot lot of the existing house and the 50 foot lot for the proposed lot. It's a, it's a subdivision by the current owner of the mm -hmm. house next door. That's fronting on Hanover. Got it. Yeah. Move on? Yeah. Item number 11-2019-270-BZY, 12-14 East 48th Street, Manhattan. There are no notice requirements for extensions of time to construct. Nonetheless, the initial application was served and, um, and hearing was noticed to officials. Perhaps that's because this is an extension under what is effectively a vesting position, uh, provision of Section 81-621 of the zoning resolution. The community board recommends approval. Had a very, very detailed, very carefully written uh, resolution. Um, there are some threshold questions that we have to address as part of the term of this extension that's set forth in the zoning resolution. Um, the, the first was, was the application for this extension filed, to, filed at the BSA prior to January 31, 2020? And yes, um, you were all prior to, but it was filed according to the SharePoint staff on September 26. Um, we only have the authority to extend the permit for one year from uh, January 31st, 2020 for um, a TCO that needs to be issued by um, the 31st, uh, January 31st, 2021. Um, and we only can do that if the har hardship or circumstances beyond the applicant's control prevented construction completion. Um, the applicant explained that there were issues during excavation where they encountered some concrete that had to be chopped out and it took them several, a, a lot of time to get it out. Um, and uh, the subcontractor um, who was hired to do the concrete pours ends up filing for bankruptcy and can't keep up with the pours. And that, if I understand it, slowed down the construction by four months or something like that. Um, also, the other uh, test is that um, recovery of substantially all expenditures would not be possible with a conforming building, uh, which is a, um, a hotel in this particular case. Applicant explains that it has expended over $45 million to date, it's actually a lot more than that, on the construction of a hotel and that the building cannot be repurposed since it either doesn't meet code requirements for residential use or um, if it were converted to office use, much of the work would need to be removed, configured and so on. Um, the other finding is that there are no safety, health, welfare reasons for disallowing continuance. Um, and I'd say on that, since it's only been two years since the enactment of the zoning text, it does not appear that such health, safety, welfare issues exist. There's not been enough time for there to be a significant change in facts. Um, I want to note that um, for our benefit, because we talk about this a lot, these are essentially the second set of tests in the case known as Putnam Armand versus Town of Southeast, a 1976 Second Department decision, which um, um, and those tests are made subsequent to initial finding of vesting at the time of the rezoning. So the initial tests, we say, are substantial construction and extent substantial expenditures. Then you invest initially at the time of, zone, of the rezoning. And then subsequent to that, you look at those cases of abandonment, recruitment, and um, health, safety, welfare. So this is, so there, so city planning's text tracks Putnam. Um, and, um, I, and in the case of Putnam, there was a 15 year lapse. Uh, time elapse between, or time difference between the rezoning and coming back to renew. Um, and, and there was a recoup to a great deal of their investment. Yes. 
Yeah, so they went through all the tests, but the court in part <laughs> set the, what the standards are, and that's what we use when we have someone coming back a long time after um, a vesting. Okay. Anybody? Based on the set of findings that they're required to meet, I believe they've provided all the necessary documentations and justification for me to be convinced that they meet. I think they were very clear and detailed in how yes. they would not be able to recoup their investment if they had to do the lesser of two evils, which would even be to convert this to office use just by all of the interior demolition and the repermitting that would add time. They've convinced me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I would agree with them. With what was said, uh, the only the only thing that I just want to put on the record because I, I did review this is in the affidavit uh, submitted by DC Mom. There was it was a statement indicating that would be significant. It's kind of language like that would be significant work need to be done to the foundation, including probably additional caseons. Uh, the reason for that is because the an office building, the life load for it would be like 10 PSF more than um, a hotel. I, I just want to say that 10 PSF, we usually design these kind of buildings for total floor load of 200, the foundations, for 200 PSF. So if the life load is going to go up by 10, the 10 over 200 is just 5%. We usually, when we design caissons, if we need 3.5 cases, we cannot put 3.5, we usually have 4. So I just want to like note that the likelihood for additional foundation strengthening would be minimal. Uh, but I, I would agree that the floor beams, other structural elements may require strengthening and uh, like significant additional work to be done. So I'm in general agreement was what well. was submitted so far. I was satisfied with the application. I thought it was thorough and uh, complete. Although I did not, I know that, I'm not sure if the other commission has found it, but there, there were uh, two, I believe, two hearings on violations. I'm not sure if we got the results of those hearings. There was a hearing on um, the right. seventh. And yeah, and but you know, one thing I do have to say about construction violations, it's a lot different than um, a person operating a building. While you're cons building, while you're in construction, there is an inspector coming to your site, in some cases, every day, depending on your neighbors, right? And they're issuing violations constantly, and you're responding to them during the construction process. So I, I don't want to be involved in this. Yeah. I'd like to know what, if, what the status is. Okay, involves. just to know the status, okay. Zoning calendar, continued hearing items, item number 12, 2018, 167 BC. <coughs> Excuse me, 1133 East 22nd Street, Brooklyn. Um, a survey was provided and dimensions on the existing drawings corrected to reflect actual yard sizes. The demolition drawings were revised and show linear feet of joist retention, which I think is a very good way of quantifying existing building fabric to be retained. It's actually really good drawings. Um, calculations of 50% to be, ha however, calculations of 50% to be retained must be floor by floor and not combine totals of all the floors. So that those calculations have to be done quickly. Also, we need dimensions at, um, uh, of all, on all of the existing walls, um, then all the walls to be retained so that the percentage of retention claim can be verified. So um, they're not dimensioning, the, the point is that they don't dimension the existing walls and they don't dimension all of the walls to be retained and then adding them up, oh, that's the other part, and, the, and in addition to show the calculations, four foot six, 10 foot 11, that way you can verify that all of the, all of the walls that are existing are being added up, and all the walls to be retained are being added up, and when you do the math, that equals 50%. Um, 
based on the site plan of surrounding properties and their rear yards, I actually don't see justification for a 25 foot deep rear yard at the second and third floor. <coughs> I think this as a compromise should be pulled back to 27 feet at the second floor and 30 feet at the third floor. Um, the open space res uh, ratio calculations were corrected properly. I was pretty impressed that part. Yeah, that seems very comfortable with open space cal ratio calculations. The total floor area was brought down to less than one FAR and diagrammed. Um, an FAR study was provided, and there are at least eight houses on the social block with similar FARs. An open space ratio study, at least that's its title, was also provided, but I'm hesitant to guess whether that, that's open space ratio or open space or a combination of both. Um, in any event, the side and front yards are fairly deep in this situation compared to many of these applications, so open space is probably in line with the area characteristics. Um, they do need to show compliance with front yard planting requirements. Um, I thought the submission was good good and clear, so if they just make the changes um, I mentioned, we can finish this up. Anybody? Just for the, um, for the date, the revision date on the drawing set, they updated the revised. I saw the date as November 2019, if you can put my a date. day, month, year. Yep. Item number 13, 2019-6 BZ, 138 East 39th Street, Manhattan. This is your Apostle Church. Yes. Um, I just want to note for our, our benefit, we, uh, on our calendar, we say it's in an R8 zoning district. It's, it's an R8B. Oh, um, yeah. Um, I also, um, I don't think the BSA zoning analysis she provided or the P-01 drawing are correct about the requirements for a community facility in an R8B um, with respect to rear yard lot coverage height, um, which must be in the quality housing. Um, um, I mean, sorry, height as to quality housing or the number of stories proposed. I think none of that is accurate as to the RAB. Um, you have to go to the community facility regulations, and then there are special regulations for community facilities, and you have to make sure that you're reading the right one. Right? The statement of facts doesn't agree with the drawings and the BSA zoning calculation, zoning analysis sheet. Um, it just, this is just a comment because it's frustrating when nothing is agreeing. Um, it would have been great had the applicant's council actually reviewed the submission prior to submitting. That saves the board the trouble of doing the corrections that should be done by applicant's council. Um, floor plans are also very difficult to read in PDF form, so they need to be resubmitted. There's a lot that I was just going on, um, you know, whatever. Uh, assumption because I couldn't read it. The project has been revised to create a request only a waiver of the second floor incursion into the rear yard by the ceremonial room. The second floor extension is to be built on top of the existing first floor rear yard extension and but for the fact of the second story that it is would be allowed as of right as a permitted obstruction under section 24-33 as the incursion is just under 23 feet above curb level, so if there were no floor, that would be as of right. No waiver for lot coverage up to a height of 23 feet is needed pursuant to section 24-12, so that's something that's incorrect about the analysis um, by the applicant. Um, we need to clarify in the statement of facts whether the previously granted variance was to allow an enlargement at the first floor or at the second floor as is proposed today. Uh, I, I think one of the reasons for the confusion is the floors are being re-characterized, right? Mm -hmm. um, lift, yeah, so there's something, it's being lifted to create a basement out of a cellar and so are the other around, whichever. And, um, and so as a result, the count is different. And so the, when the applicant describes what was approved, 
sometimes it's the first floor, sometimes it's the second floor, and I don't know which which is right. So they would need to be clearer about that. Um, they need to modify the argument in the statement of facts. The BSA's history of approvals is not based on programmatic needs in view of unique physical condition finding. It is based on the doctrine of deference to houses of worship and schools established by the Court of Appeals in Cornell v. Banyardi. The programmatic needs aspect of an application under this doctrine is the effort to find the minimum variance necessary to afford relief. I, I want to correct it because we've unfortunately had applications where that's the argument that's made and it's not it, either you <coughs> qualify under the Cornell doctrine or you have to find a unique physical condition, whether or not you're not for profit. Um, so um, we need to correct the statement of facts. No law coverage waiver, as I said, is required pursuant to 2412. And the statement of facts at page 10 states that the application is for a school. Is this an application for a school everywhere else, including at page 11, the facility is described as a house of worship or a religious seminary. So please make your application consistent throughout and, and read it and check it and things like you're supposed to do. Other comments? <laughs> the, um, it's not only that the statement of fact is not in agreement with the drawings. Actually, the drawings themselves are not in agreement with them themselves. As if you, if you look at the bubble set and the clean set, the uh, first of all, the floor areas are, are not like clean at all, clear at all. You can see them. And in addition, if you see, if you're able to see some numbers and you look at the bubble and the clean set, the numbers are different. So it sounds like the bubble set itself is, is an older set. So instead of, uh, uh, they, they might go and just, you know, reprint and, and resubmit. Before we do that, please take a look at the drawings. Yeah. And I just have to say, um, your description is so polite, and I don't feel very polite with this applicant anymore. This is a mess. There's no reason why it's a mess. You're supposed to check the materials before you submit them. And that's your job. And that's what ends up making an application that's simple take several hearings. This should not have taken several hearings. And now it's going to take more hearings because, frankly, I won't accept a submission tonight that we have to review in the middle of the night because then we don't find those errors. Then council ends up looking at the for, to write the resolution and then doesn't know how big the building is or whatever, right? And so... It just seems to me like the applicant is resting on the fact that this is a fairly minimal ask and therefore not putting in all of the work to give us the detail, the degree of detail that we actually need. And that to me also goes to the programmatic needs statement because I had raised a question prior to this hearing about how you have a ceremonial room that accommodates 74 people and you don't have that many people coming. And the answer I got is basically, well, we have lots of meetings and we have at least 50 people. That still isn't justifying 74. There's no talk about growth or anything. It's just that, you know, it leads me to believe that, well, you know, they want us to just give it to us. It's only adding another floor in the 23 feet. Mm -hmm. Okay. And that's problematic because the next application may not be that minimal an ask. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. Oh, that's a good. Thank you for that. That's a very good point. You actually have to make the argument for the thing you're asking for and do it in the proper way. And yes, without a programmatic needs analysis, how can you even say programmatic needs are what's driving your application? Yeah. It's infuriating, I have to say. Um, these applications are the ones that just linger here because we can't get the work out of the applicant. Okay. Item number 14, 2019, 29 BC, 30 Clinton Avenue, Brooklyn. Okay. Um, um, I didn't find, so I'm just going to go through, but we did get um, a school safety letter just this morning from the DOT, um, which is 
problematic. So, but I'll just go through my comments and then read that letter. Uh, I didn't find any additional submission to support the con contention that a full site search in as of right districts was performed. We had many questions about that at the last hearing. All there is in the record to satisfying the findings. Right. But like what? Right? Yeah. So it's so felt like so for sound, so for that sound. this yes. current does not disturb yeah. the neighborhood or the yeah. you know, that yeah. kind of a thing. If you, if you think about like some of the other PCEs that we have looked at recently, we're getting wall sections because we want to see what the deep the sound attenuation details are. But most of the time if we get building sections, it's maybe because the architect already has building sections, right? And that's just because they're already working on the rest of the building or something like that. And when we ask for sections, it's because we're trying to understand the relationship of the residential unit to the PCE, right? So um, in this case, you know, it's like, I'm not sure how that Would sections be helpful in looking at the clear heads in the basement and, and determining... No, but that's building codes. That's no, that's a building. Okay. Right? And for sure there's no head clearance underneath the swimming pool, right? It's going to be a swimming pool with a... How, I don't know if they have diving in this program, but it's a four or five foot deep swimming pool. Obviously it's going to go down and they won't have head clearance. But that's a DOB call, not okay. a... Right. Item number three, 2016 4149 BC, 500 508 Van Ness Avenue, the Bronx. Okay. I believe we've had a late submission on Van Ness, but I don't remember what it is. Something that we just got, like this morning or on Friday. I don't remember what it is. Okay. Um, okay. So again, I didn't find proof of service of initial application to officials. Yeah, that was my proof of publishing. Proof of publishing, that's what it was, yeah. thanks. Yeah. So we didn't get proof of service of initial application to yeah. officials. Okay. Um, or if we did, I couldn't find it. We do have proof of notice of hearing to officials and neighbors. I note that the community board reviewed this application in 2017 and issued a report only uh, um, by the four executive committee members present. They provided a conditional approval requesting that the project include fewer than 47 dwelling units and more than 24 parking spaces. I'd like the applicant to explain why it doesn't have a recommendation from the full board. And actually, I think we should reach out to Board 11 and see if they want to hold a hearing on this. Because usually the reason you have an executive session is because the board didn't meet that month. And they feel like they're under some kind of pressure to actually get out a resolution. Um, and so the decision of four people that's not, that's not representative of the community board, though, you know, arguably according to some of the materials, there was negotiations going on amongst the community board members and others, but um, that's not the same thing as now bringing the negotiation information to your full board and having them vote on it. So we have four letters in opposition from neighbors concerned about noise, traffic, parking, density. One neighbor lives adjacent to the property. A fifth letter is from Morris Park Community Association that is opposed. So, are we talking about Van Ness or? Yeah. Yes. It's in the Bronx. So, so, yeah, Morris Park, not the other one. Are we talking Morris okay. Park? There, that's in the Bronx. It's adjacent to the Van Ness area. Oh, OK. Yeah, I'm getting good. There's also now Mars in Harlem. Okay. Yeah, Mars yeah, Park. Mars Park, yeah. right, sorry. Mm -hmm. so, um, so the Mars Park Community Association was opposed for similar reasons plus socioeconomic impacts, which is something that the EAS um, looks at when, when there's a trigger. Um, a sixth letter from the 22 voting participants in the 2017 meeting of the Van Ness Neighborhood Alliance were split with 10 in favor um, um, of the project, nine opposed, and three abstentions. The issues that raised they raised were the project's potential to improve the values of sur surrounding properties, but also impact on infrastructure, density, traffic, and parking. Um, I have to say there, before we can consider this 
even any further, really, there are over $65,000 in ECB violations for hazardous conditions at the site that date back to 2007 and were issued as recently as February of this year. So the board will not consider deciding favorably on a case until all fines are satisfied. Poor site conditions negatively affect the community and indicate irresponsible management of the site by ownership. The EAS should be sure to be studying all of the issues raised by the community. The Van Nest Alliance noted inaccuracies in the traffic studies, which must be corrected and brought up to date. I note that the neighbors and associations discussed this project in 2017, as I said. It was filed at the BSA on March 21st, 2016, and received a dismissal warning in October 2017. The December 2017 submission lingered at the BOD office in expectation of subsequent revisions that never appeared. So it was decided to put this on for hearing, even though the application is out of date and inaccurate or incomplete in many areas. Given how long it has lingered here, we might even ask if the owner is serious about prosecuting this case. Um, for one, the statement of facts is inconsistent about the current state of the site. To clarify, the existing buildings were demolished and demolition signed off according to Viz as of October 2016. The photos are also old and need to be updated. The site has been cleared of the vegetation. Um, we need to provide a survey that reflects current conditions. This is an R5 zoning district, so all of the analyses should be in Article 2. Um, they were jumping around. I didn't really understand that. Section 24-162 limits community facility floor area in a residential building 2.6 mm -hmm. for a total FAR of 1.85, not 2, so that's incorrect on all the materials. The FAR of the proposed is inconsistently described in the statement of facts. Um, I have lots of numbers, so I pick some. <laughs> the uniqueness study really is just a site condition report by the engineer and does not explain how this site is uniquely burdened by the retaining wall. The report indicates that the wall is not on the subject property, so arguably another owner is responsible for its repair and maintenance if it's in bad shape as claimed, so I'm not sure that you can even use that as one of your costs. I don't actually understand how that works because if it's owned by the railroad, you're not allowed to touch it, right? Or if you touch it, um, I assume they would pay for it, but I, I don't know the answer to that because it's theirs. Um, on the hardship complained of in the as of right, um, three semi-attached three-story houses, I'm not understanding why, why the yard has to be filled in with soil. It seems like there are several ways to approach the site. One, to have bridges from the sidewalk to the building for access for both cars and pedestrians, as is common in this area and others like it. It seems to me that only the 10-foot front yard requirement is forcing the bridge access, actually. Otherwise, the building could be built along the property line, like right to the property line, with no or limited need for fill if you even needed fill. Um, the zoning resolution does not require that natural grade be brought to meet sidewalk grade. Um, the proposed project appears to use to its advantage the already excavated cellar, because it's like a free cellar, um, and basement, to accommodate parking and basement level apartment units. Why can't the as of right or near as of right do the same using the cellar, which doesn't count as floor area, as the platform that brings the building to or close to grade and treating the cellar as community facility rental space, for example, or parking for a multi-unit single building? There's no explanation anywhere of why the claimed hardship justifies a three to four times increase in floor area and a three times increase in height. Um, in addition, the as of right doesn't provide any community facility floor area, so the comparison with the proposed isn't equivalent. Applicant seems to misunderstand the purpose of the typical development scenario, um, which is the one that eliminates the hardship and results in a viable project. Here, even the typical is argued to cost the same as the as of right and, pro and produces the same negative return. So, according to that, there's no such thing as a viable project on the site. Mm -hmm. Community. Um, 
I'm sorry, Commissioner Atwood Brown will go through the financial analysis in more detail, of course. The statement of facts makes reference to a commercial floor in the proposed, but the drawings show its community facility, so there's lots of inconsistencies. Next. Um, I think I'm, whatever I'd be saying would be repeating much of what you have said, Chair. Um, first of all, in the proposed drawing, um, the lot area of the proposed building, FAR, they vary throughout the submission document. Uh, with regards to the alternate um, as of right um, to, um, to deal with the great difference, I have the same comment as you do, is like you have shown in the proposed, you're providing a parking below grade with a community facility above, which is a good rental space, and you can avail your, yourself of that FAR of the community, and then the as of right residential can start at grade, and then you don't have to do much of the fill, and, and that should be looked at as the as of right base, and then you convince us whether that works or not. Um, uh, without that, I, I don't think that, uh, I think there's a mismatch. Uh, with regards to, um, no, the as of right. Yeah, I have the same question on the fill. Why is the fill necessary and why is that a hardship? And uh, in terms of the minimal, I think they need to show an alternative uh, that incorporates the below grade parking and minimizes the fill uh, with the community facility below grade before. Mm -hmm. So um, as for the uniqueness, their own statement says that for, as to the sunken bowl shape of the lot, all of the lots on the north side of Adams Street are exposed to the same sunken lot condition. And the buildings are accessed from bridges connecting the sidewalk way to the buildings. How is this unique? It isn't. As to the two 200 foot long retaining walls that run along Van Nest and Adam Street, they think they are deteriorated, but they don't know for sure. And they say that they would have to do extensive investigation work to determine the state of the wall and determine repair. To me, that means that this claim is not right for including in this application. You have to do the background work. You have to come up with the dollar and cents analysis of what this actually means in terms of hardship and what the cost is to the asset right. right. As for the defining self-created, how much of the waivers are necessitated or based on construction of a large massive building next to these deteriorated mm. retaining walls? Minimum, I don't think they're even close. Now, as to the financials, as to format, they actually are done wrong. The narrative talks about $1 million in hardship costs added to the typical as of right. It then also says the as of right costs of $3 million more than the typical. Then in the report, they analyze the typical as of right and the proposed and address the actual as of right at this site with about three sentences. That's not how you do the financials. Now I'm just going to literally read all of the things that are wrong with the finances so that I don't make any mistakes. Page four mentions supportive grants and economic incentives. Who gets the direct benefit? If the developer, then it needs to be in the financials, i.e. 421A. Site value, it is based on vacant land. No explanation of comparable similarities and differences, no adjustments whatsoever. $30.55 for available uh, building area square footage times 12,900 uh, 12, square feet equals $394,000 and $394,095. That's on page 13. However, page 19 says the comparable derived site value is $315,265. Now, if this is the comparable rate, then why are they using $480,000 in the pro forma? Also, why does this differ from page 13, which is based on comparables? We should only use values suggested by the comparables. Residential condominiums. The unit mix on page 16 does not match the plans. The plans show five two-bedroom and four three-bedroom apartments in the as of right, but page 16 says six three-bedrooms and three two-bedroom apartments in the as of right. Sales price for residential, $469 a square foot for 44,148 square feet of net sellable area. The comparables are mixed two-bedroom and one-bedroom comparables. No three-bedroom comparables. 
the sales are from 2015 and 2016. No recent comps and no time trending of old comps to, to the present or at least to 2017 when the report was submitted. Then the adjusted average price per square foot is applied to the entire net sellable of 44,148 square feet in the proposed and 12,270 square feet in the as of right on page 11. But this doesn't match the proposed sellable square feet in the pro forma page 23 of 39,450 square feet of gross building area sellable. But it does match the 44,148 square feet proposed residential square footage, which is listed as sellable residential on page 24. Then, if you then check their work by dividing to try and figure out which square footage is right, you check their work by dividing the proposed residential sales income by the sales price of $470 a square foot, you get only 35,253 square feet for the proposed, and you get only 7,831 square feet for the as of right. So what is going on? The subject is adjusted upwards, but without a narrative as to how each comparable differs from the subject. I think the average sales price unadjusted is then adjusted upwards by 10% for proximity, 15% for new construction, 7% for views, and 15% for parking and amenities. I can't even say how they have arrived at an as of right residential sales income or a proposed residential sales income because the rentable numbers don't match the narrative, so there's no way to know what's going on there. Parking income. How did they get to their income assumptions for parking, which is zero? Community facility income. How did they get to their income assumptions of $687,750? What are they? There's no comparable for community facility, and there's no conversation about community facility at all. And there is also no, com no conversation about retail, so they just don't even address it. Construction costs. The as of right, approximately $3.8 million for nine units on page 20. The proposed, approximately $10.5 million for 46 units on page 20. Why on page 23 are the basic construction costs listed as $3.374 million for the as of right and $13.931 million for the proposed? Why on page 24 are the construction costs li listed as $3.374 million hard costs and $928,730 soft costs for the as of right and $12.538 million hard costs and $2.684 million soft costs for the proposed? None of these numbers match at all from any of the pages. Special costs. 999000 to build up the site and protect adjacent properties for the as of right only. Yet on, on the letter on page 71 says they are incorporating this cost in both the as of right and the proposed. And with that, <laughs> I, I, I would like confess I don't have to worry about engineering anymore. <laughs> but in, in, in short, if, if this site I, I don't believe, if, if there is a case called this variance or something like that, hmm. it's the opposite of the variance. This, this <laughs> side <laughs> would, qualify, would be like the only candidate that qualifies for it. This site is, is very well privileged. I don't think it has a hardship at all. And, and this is like very brief. Second, and this is general to the variance applicant communities, if instead of wasting your time and our time, this is rules, you cannot base a variance on an assumption. If you are applying for a variance based on such, you have to prove that such is real and actually exists. This, this variance is totally based on the adjacent retaining wall and the existing conditions of a depressed site. The site is actually uh, 12 to 17, if I recall the numbers, feet below sidewalk. This is not a hardship. That, that free excavation is not a hardship. You, you, you got a freely excavated site that you don't have to pay for the excavation. You could, you could utilize the, the, this free excavation 
in, 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 if you plug this in construction cost analysis, you will see how advantages this is to the side. This is number one. Number two, regarding the retain rule. And I'm, I'm going to go over just three points. The excavation, this is number one. The retain rule. I read the retain rule at worst acts as a free excavation support. If you want to use it right. If, if, if this retain rule, if you're allowed to touch this retain rule at all, if you're not allowed to touch it, then be it. It's outside the property. You can't touch it. You can handle your construction inside. Even after construction, if you're concerned about this wall falling down or deforming or something like that, you know what? We all drive on highways where we have huge rock cuts, and these rock cuts can can like drop at any time. So they put something called rock fall protection. So if you are worried about the retaining wall might collapse after the construction of the building, you can put some sort of a structural barrier between your building and this retaining wall in such a way, and design this in such a way. If the wall starts to play crazy, this barrier, this structural barrier, is going to take the impact of whatever soil mass that's going to move. If there's soil mass, at all, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna come to this. Yeah, but if you can put something that protects your building from the retaining in case it gets crazy and stop you. What's the thing that you would put to protect it? Is it a cage? Those it, cages? You, could, you could put tons of things. The simplest way to think about it is to design your perimeter rule, to put a perimeter rule and design this perimeter rule to withstand the impact of any rock or, or soil that's collapsing and, and, and moving, then I, I would say this would be like the very straightforward way to address this concern. Yes. And that would be a typical wall construction that a site would have, let's say, for yes, the only, yes, the only thing you, you need to consider is and when we put wall in, in like adjacent to uh, let's say solid mass or, or rock mass. We designed this wall to withstand what we call it the uh, static pressure from the adjacent soil. If you want to put a wall like this, you're not going to have a permanent static pressure from the soil because it's not really in touch of the wall. It's 10 feet inbound. But if the wall starts like to fall down and some, some rock starts to roll, and hit that way, you would design this one for like taking that impact from any rock pieces that fall down from, from the edge. But would that be a more expensive role than if you were just building no, on a flat no, site? No, definitely not. No. No. Because that the, the design mode is gonna be significantly less. But the, the third point I wanna address you is the engineer in, in the uniqueness study is talking about I'm going to put fill, structural fill, and I don't know why. And because I, I'm going to put fill, the fill is not going to be good. This is incorrect, Mr. Engineer. When you put fill, there is something called structural fill. The New York City building code requires you to put the fill in a controlled manner in such a way to make sure that when you put structural fill, you can put your building on top of that. And, and he's going further and saying, because I'm going to put film, the film is not going to be good. So the building code is, is, is not going to like it. So I need to put the foundations. So it's, it's kind of he's creating his own mess. And, and his own self-created hardship. Yeah, and, and I would say the foundation and this side and structural thing, this sounds engineering-wise. This sounds to me like the worst solution ever. You don't need to put fill. All what you need to do, I believe in my opinion, and I'm going to ask you to give me a geo if you want to insist on the approach that you're adapting, but I believe, based on my experience in Bronx, at this side, if you just think, if you scratch your, the, the ground at the lower elevation of, of this side, I believe you're going to find rock. And, and you describe the routine rule, the existing routine rule, as dry, stag, rock, Pieces. So this retaining wall is not built with mortar. It's built with just dry stacking pieces 
of what? Doesn't this kill you something? It's it right you? there. It doesn't have resistance because it doesn't have any water in it. Mm -hmm. So if this wall is subject to any lateral pressure from the adjacent soil, I'm sorry to say soil, but let's say soil from there. If it's subject to any lateral pressure, it will, it will just collapse because it doesn't have any like strengths. It's just pieces stacked on top of each other. And except for the self weight of these pieces, they can they are not bound together. So the next if if I name the one who's looking at this, the next thing to think about is, oh this wall is standing probably behind this wall there is something that is not pushing this wall laterally. And th what this thing could be, it could grow. Mm -hmm. And this what? Planck is very well known for high mm -hmm. top of rock innovation. And, and it wouldn't cost much. It would cost you like two, three grants to bring in an ex excavator and dig actually inside your site to see how deep is the rock. And if you get shallow rock, you can, again, if you get shallow rock in addition to free excavation, free SOE, then you're the most lucky guy in the world. You, you, you got tiny footings because of the shallow rock condition. You got a wall that's in place that at worst you could either put some sharp clearing, show this wall temporarily, and, and, and then bend them inside and, and you're done for the day. And you didn't need to worry about excavation. So uh, I, I don't know how this size is claimed to be a matter of, of a hardship that's related to foundation design or construction. But I, I don't see a case here, and, and I, I'm like suggesting that we don't go so far with that case because I, 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 don't, I, I can look and see the future in this case. And, uh, it's just not going to fly. Can I just add one thing to what Commissioner Shetha said? What is interesting, this being a corner lot, it also really takes advantage of that because the site is sloping down from Adam to Van Ness. And so Van Ness, it has a lower elevation. So you really can access the lower part, the sunken yeah. portion, through the Van Ness without having to go through a much more torture process had you been interior lot with no access other than from that grade. Which is, which, is, uh, which is done, by the way, in the, in the proposed. If you look at the proposed, That's they, didn't, they didn't back them. Right. They didn't put deep foundation in. They didn't have a very good part of what is existing. Right. And all what they did is they extended one of the um, one of the floor slabs, the first the first, the basement floor slab, the very floor that first floor slab, they extended it to the retaining room. And the retaining room is shown uh, schematically in, in different it's shown as a gravity room. It's not it's it's the way it's existed, that width of the room is vertical. The way they showed it. It's, it's like a table. I'm not sure if their intention to modify the, the design of this wall. No. And, and again, if you look at the proposed condition, the section of the proposed condition, we put one of the following section I, I believe, section, yes, section I, on the proposed condition. This is page 12 in the PDF. If the guy is creating his, his own mess, He's going next, immediately next to the footing of that retaining wall, or of the modified footing of that retaining wall. And he's putting one of the foundations for the proposed building. Why? I believe this is either outside, the, he's showing the lot line, I understand, but if you are a good structural engineer, just move this footing in, three, four feet, to avoid digging next to a footing. That, so you want to install a footing and then undermine this footing. Again, amazing engineering, structural engineering task here. But you don't have to dig next to the footing that you just installed. You could just move the footing inside and can't leave it there. So I see a lot of like made up things in this application that and, and they did a really good job in, in switching aside from, from a disvariance to a variance. So, but it's simply I, I don't think this this is working here. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. I just want to piggyback on Commissioner Shedder's uh, statement about our continued consideration on this matter. 
Uh, I do appreciate the, my colleagues' uh, careful analysis, and I, too, have spent a lot of time on this application, but I don't believe that this application merited the, the time that we've, we've put on it. And that's because I don't believe that this, this application comes close to remotely arguing for an A finding. Um, I am glad that we're able to determine that it doesn't meet any of the findings, but the, as Commissioner Shedd st stated and uh, Commissioner Holly Brown stated, they, the assumptions, it, they, they base their, um, they base their hardship on assumptions, and I don't believe that's appropriate. The only hardship that they didn't base an assumption is something that I'm not, is the, the ground being sunken down. I'm not sure, uh, that that is a hardship. Um, in fact, uh, I, again, second Commissioner Shutter's point, that this may very well be to their benefit because they already have an excavated basement or, or cellar floor uh, at this property. Mm -hmm. So again, okay. I, I don't believe that we should spend... So, so instead of um, spending time on the financials and so on, the entire discussion should tomorrow should be, do you have an A finding? Because if there's no A, we don't talk about anything else. Well, do you have an A finding today? Yeah, you yeah, an application yeah. that stated assumptions, and you, you've had the time, you know, four, three years since this application was filed, to, to try to show that there is, there is a hardship here, and you're asking us to, to, to make a finding on assumptions. I don't believe that's fair to us. And I don't believe that you should be getting much more time, because you did we already receive a dismissal letter. You, you already, they, there was ample time to provide evidence in support of an application. Right. And, and just to be clear, I, I don't want to be misunderstood here. I either didn't mean that tomorrow we'll let's close on board. No, right, right. I, I'm in favor of giving them mm. like the chance to hear us, come back tomorrow with, with probably a counter argument, put the facts in front of us, and, and, and then even get another chance after like the back and forth tomorrow. And, and it should be the next submission, and that's it. Yes. If we see, like, hope, we continue. If we do not, mm -hmm. let's not repeat. Yeah, we don't want to go on and on and on. It was on. two weeks ago. Yes, right. I believe it should be based on, exclusively on the A. If on the A. If there's no A that's proven to us, then no. there's no reason for us to talk about any of the other stuff, because for me, we don't want um, Commissioner Alderman to have to read the financials prepared by a beginner. I just want to say that there's actually an article that they need to pay heed to. It's an article in New York Yimby that talks about this site and it says, when the Times profiled the neighborhood in 2001, a local historian informed the paper that the city decided to run sewers to the area but found the bedrock too thick to penetrate. <laughs> Instead, workers raised the streets using leftover rock from the blasting of the Jerome Park Reservoir and put the pipes in the new raised up layer. <laughs> I didn't count, I didn't see this, but I counted in the glue from the retaining wall not falling down. And if you wall that old, yes. it's subject to something, mm -hmm. and it's got stagged and it's, it's, mm -hmm. it has voids in it. But if you also think that this retaining wall was probably built like in 1904, right? How did construction work work in 1904? The guys used whatever was laying around. So they're like, let's fill the retaining wall. There's some piles of rocks. Let's just use that. So that, that's also the giveaway that that's probably the subterranean condition. Um, but they just used the rocks that were excavated when they built that elevated portion for the railroad. You know what? The article actually goes on to say the city raised the streets in Van Nest around the quarter of the century, creating hundreds of rocks like 508 Van Nest Avenue. Oh. Plenty of older three-story homes in the area were retrofitted with street entrances on the second floor because their ground floors were suddenly a full story below the street. Ah. So it basically lays it out that this is a typology for the entire community. No uniqueness here. Could you Can um, we'll submit that to submit? Probably submit that. to submit? Sure. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I would be even careful calling this retaining wall. I would, if, if it has rock right behind it, I would call it just a cladding wall. And, and you can see those driving in that if you are, 
Uh, right, you can, by, I mean, by Columbia University, you can, if you look to the left, if you're going uptown, you can see tons of walls, like they are running block, and they are just stuck to the rock face. It's, they are not retaining anything, mm -hmm. but they are there and they didn't, I, I didn't, like, hear about any movement of any of these walls, and I don't think that kind of rock in, in Bronx, it, it be, it's, it's not like the, if, if you think about the rock in Bronx, it's not like the one in Staten Island. It's not simple kind of like that. With water and it deteriorates and it starts like pushing against walls like that. It's, it's kind of like more uh, like stable rock. More uh, durable rock so it doesn't, it doesn't deteriorate that fast. Well, if the condition, as you have mentioned, I mean, from Upper Manhattan to the Bronx, it starts becoming that Manhattan's sish, and, and there are so many parks that's been created, that's been carved in layers, and the walls that are supporting these uh, stepped parks, I went to City College, good part of City College is made out of all of this rock that has been excavated out of the ground, and this foundation and a lot of the retaining wall is using these rocks and they have withstood the test of time. They have been around, they are still working. Yeah, so it, it, it appears to be deteriorating, the wall, but if I mean if a wall is deteriorating like this... It's, it's not it's, a major it's, one, it's not... It, it, it's the height, is, it's tall wall. It's yeah. probably 12 to 17, yeah. probably plus. Yeah. So it's a tall wall. What I'm saying is that the deterioration here is not because it's, it, I wouldn't like describe this as a st structural distress. Right. It's just that you are making issue of the world itself. So the world is not taking the time from when it was built until today subject to, you know, environment and, and, and these like origin things. So if, if it needs to be looked at, I mean, the owner can look at it. If it needs to be stabilized, the owner can stabilize it. Mm -hmm. If you believe that the owner, which is, I'm not sure about the owner of the world, if the owner will give you the authority to, like, strengthen this world, to maintain it, then you need to prove first that it's structurally unsafe, and you need to justify as cool to, like, put this way in, in in a good shape, and we submit this to us after we prove that it needs something to be done. Mm -hmm. But before that, you cannot just go and say, we, we assume that the work is going to be significant, this one is going to be significant strength, it, it, it can be based on an assumption. Mm -hmm. So that, that's what I'm saying. We shouldn't like, like move so far with, with, with this case and its current stance. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Item number four, 2016, 4264, BC, 194 Moffat Street, Brooklyn. Okay. We have proof of notice of hearing to officials and neighbors and um, proof of service of initial application to officials. Community board provided a letter, quote, not recommending support of the project, unquote, stating that the proposed is not in context with the character of the block with its two-family row houses, small units, and lack of affordable rentals. With respect to the uniqueness study of the 31 existing residential lots, all are on lots 25 feet wide or less. The subject is 32 feet wide, so falls outside of the typical residential lot size. Uniqueness study, the uniqueness study should include parking lots as vacant lots, since the subject could also be used as a parking lot, so they shouldn't distinguish that um, from vacant. On the as of rights, there is no explanation for the hardship that is driven by the narrowness of the lot, other than market, con market conditions, i.e. it is hard to sell. Rentals are not discussed by the letters from the realtors. Um, I'd like to know why wasn't use group six office considered for this lot. Um, and, um, but I do have to say, um, 
and it's always this conflict about how these variances work, um, that the M1 zoning for this social block is completely out of character with the existing 19th and early 20th century buildings on it, and really just makes no sense. The sliver behind it, it uh, um, accommodated for the Long Island Railroad and parking area, um, that was obviously the target of the rezoning effort, but I, I have to say it's like what was city planning thinking when they put all these residential buildings in an end zone. Um, I don't think a firm map was provided, so provided. Um, on costs, um, the, which of course I'll let Commissioner Ockley Brown fill out, but the only reason the remedial action work is required is because of variance is subject to seeker. If this were as of right, there would be fewer to no cleanup or investigation costs, so that should come out of the as of right. Um, I can't imagine how a slab on a grade one-story concrete block box with a roof would cost a million dollars to construct. So, I mean, it sounds like it's getting very chic finishes or something, I don't know what. Um, similar for the MTA involvement, the site is very far away from the Long Island Railroad tracks. I doubt seriously there would be much involvement, if any, with the MTA. Um, but that number isn't factored into the analysis anyway, though it's listed as one of the hardships, right? Um, with respect to the proposed, if A and B are met, building height should not be greater than other adjacent residential uses in the M1. The streetscape shows this building towering over the neighbors. If the claim is that those houses don't suffer a hardship because they are residential, then putting the site in the same position as they are should satisfy the minimum variance finding. Um, they need to, um, for one, reduce significantly the height of the building, but once they do that to show materials on all the elevations. Um, the applicant cites to only one portion of the Department of Buildings bulletin concerning elevators. There are also Building Code, Fair Housing Act, and ADA requirements for accessibility to housing. So I'm not persuaded that the issue is fully researched to support the claim that no elevator is needed in a 10-unit building. And from a public policy perspective, perspective, I'm opposed to creating new inaccessible walk-ups where tenants can't age or become disabled in place. So um, if this turns out to be a multi-family building um, of more than two units, I'd say um, provide an elevator. Um, um, and then uh, we do have DEP air quality and noise sign-off. And I think we have a sign up, sign up for the wrap and the chance. Okay, and a PC. Okay. Um, so in terms of the uniqueness, I agree that the, the zoning is mismatched with the surrounding use, except for what's to the rear of this block. Um, I, um, I think in terms of the use that has been proposed, it's reasonable. I do. I am concerned about the degree of the variance that has been asked in terms of the FAR and the building height. Um, I question again um, that the site is within 200 feet of uh, the LIR train line, which is at grade, unlike situations where there might be more impact if it's below grade or there is a s elevated structure. This is at grade and, and it's hitting an angle, so maybe a very small portion of it, maybe within 200 feet, that does not uh, create, I do not believe in it, and not yet <coughs> that that would impose, bless you, uh, would create a hardship. And so they need to provide a survey if that's really the reason for it. And again, I would defer to Commissioner Shetta to uh, give, uh, shed some light as to if, a, if an ad grade train line would have similar kind of issue. Um, and the project is very poorly configured. The dwelling units, especially the studios, and I think instead of providing quantity of in, uh, units, if they provide fewer units with better layout, they might get a better financial uh, return. Um, uh, the statement of facts, there are mis um, you know, there are mistakes in it. It refers to as a right alternative to building as a height of as 23 foot, whereas as of right alternate one is 30 foot, where I think it's swapped. Um, 
uh, again, in the proposed drawings and what's stated in the statement uh, with regards to the program of the spaces below grade, do not mismatch. It says there, there's a compact room required um, in the residential building there, um, because it's a nine, well, that's correct, because it's nine plus DU. So as part of the property housing, you have to provide comp compact uh, room. The statement of fact states that there are common amenity spaces provided um, for this building, including a laundry room that's provided in the cellar. The plan does not reflect that. Proposed plan does not correspond with the statement of fact program, the statement of fact uh, programming of the cellar spaces and also the amenity spaces in the building for the residential, and they need to label all the spaces. So I go back to what they're asking for, as I said, I think in terms of the use, it's reasonable. However, I question the building height and uh, the number of units that has been proposed, and if the units are laid out reasonably, uh, I think the return would be much better, and the height should be lowered um, significantly. So I don't think that there is a uniqueness here, although I found the paperwork needlessly complicated. I think that the FAR, uh, not the FAR, the uniqueness study just goes around and around in circles, but the ultimate finding is that there are seven out of 27 lots in the M1 in that radius that are either 25 by 100 or merged together with the adjacent lot to total no more than 32 feet in width. And so, because there's, there's two lots that are used in conjunction with each other, and both of those are 16-foot yeah. wide lots, just like the subject. So if you count those up, with the 25 by 100-foot lot that's owned alone, the 22 by 43-foot lot that's owned alone, and another 25 by 100-foot lot that's owned alone, you end up with 7 out of 27. And that's 25% which means one out of four, which to me translates to not unique. So that's how I feel about the narrowness, as well as the fact that it's not really explained how 32 feet width really constricts the development possibilities on this site, other than to say it's located on a narrow street and there'd be difficulty with trucks maneuvering. And we've had this before when we get to lots that are over 25 feet of width. You really have to spell it out because now you're, you're asking us to open the door a little bit to allow a new type of, of lot width to come in and claim that they're too narrow. Mm -hmm. The adjacency issue to me, to the um, MTA, is not an issue. We've seen lots that are actually five and six feet next to train tunnels. That is a possible issue, but when you can't even specify how many feet you are from the tunnel or the tracks, you don't have a problem. Right. right. So just to sit there and put in the papers, you're within a 200-foot radius, to me, does not prove anything. Mm -hmm. um, they put in two realty letters, Compass and Exit Realty, and they basically say that they've marketed the site for as of right uses for an extended period of time with no buyers. How long? Well, Compass didn't specify a time period, and they only marketed the property to artists. So there are a whole lot of other as of right uses that they could have used. Exit Realty said that they were trying for 18 months and they've been trying to market it to about 100 developers for as it right uses. That's a little bit more persuasive. But then when you read the rest of their letter, they say the street is too narrow and there isn't enough available FAR in the M1, which points to a zoning issue, not a uniqueness issue. It's a market issue. And it's like one that you have spoken about often before that when you have said, the M1 does not provide enough development potential for a lot. And it's true in the industrial area. It's like, who's going to build a building if it can only be 1.0 FAR? And who's going to buy a lot where they could only have 1.0 FAR to rent for $16 or $17 a square foot? It right. just doesn't make sense. Then if we, get, if we get past A and we get to B, I have um, quite a few B comments. If you'd like, I could say them basically, but um, aside from my issues with comparables, I think the construction costs, like you suggested, are definitely a problem. The as-of-right construction costs, if you add all the 
costs together are $396.92 a square foot for a very simple one-story industrial building. It's way higher than the second as of right, which is a community facility at $200 a square foot for a finished building, or the proposed residential of $295 a square foot. So it's way too high in comparison, and it's driving the case. It's what's at, when you have a, a site that only costs two hundred thirty-seven thousand dollars to buy, and you're adding one point one million in construction costs. Well, of course, it's not going to make anything, right? You know, so it's that's the serious real problem about it. Mm -hmm. Other than that, I have questioned about the site value. Um, address the age of the sites that are used as comparables and the vast location area of the sites and there's only a minus 5% location adjustment for all comparables. In your residential rentals, your uh, first comp on your two bedroom is described as a one bedroom apartment. It's definitely an error, page 30. And so as for the minimal, if we were to get past A, B, and C, and D, <laughs> shit. All of the buildings surrounding it are two and three stories with a basement at the very largest. So this definitely should be smaller. A 6.3 cap rate is not a minimal cap rate for residential, where you have projects that could actually have negative cap rates at 1.75 as cap rates within the city. So they could definitely go smaller. Mm -hmm. um, I, I start with the railroad issue. I, I believe 200 feet is, is meaningful for me. The reason they mentioned the 200 feet is because there is a DOD requirement that if you are within 200 feet from um, a subway tunnel or structure, you need to go to the TA and get their approval before you start working with the excavation and SOE. That's why they, I believe they mentioned the 200 feet. Two things in the statement of fact, I, I, I believe that they mentioned that the site is 300 feet, which I believe is a mistake or an error that need to be corrected. The second thing is they submitted a, a three-page document. They called it MTA requirements. It's not MTA requirements. Uh, it's the DUD requirements. Mm -hmm. And the DUD require again that if you need 200 feet, go to the TA and submit to them. And, and notify them before you start anything. When they go to the TA, are they likely to get hard time from the TA? I don't believe so. I believe that like the probability to uh, get hard time from the TA for a site like this is, is like finding a black hole on the planet Earth. It's, it's not likely at all. Uh, the TA is air, is air, is air green, the railroad is air green, the site is, is way far from. If they want to build the cellar and the excavate, it, it's going to be a very straightforward job that is not suffering from any uh, like uniqueness that's coming from the adjacency to the uh, TA railroad. Uh, they mentioned the site plans. 32 feet. I'm not sure how like significant is this when it comes to building probably a warehouse. It could be because of 30 foot, 32 feet. One warehouse could be kind of like tight. But how about an, an office? If if you build an office and your side is 30 plus, I believe it, it could fly. But their financials didn't show that even they look at this option, and, and I'm afraid that if, even if they look at it, they're going to make it not fly. Very similar to the as of right scenarios that they presented. If you look at the construction cost estimate, I believe it's very really exaggerated. Uh, for a warehouse, the cost per square foot, actually I, I got $471 per square foot. For, for a warehouse. <laughs> I, I, I simply took the, the number in their financials, the total cost, I added up, and I divided this by the school for You're including the oh, SAR cost. Including the site value? Yes. Oh, okay. Uh, I was really including yeah. the site value. Yeah. Okay. I, I took the total, the total uh, development. development cost, yes. And if you look at the uh, community facilities, 3023 uh, and for the proposed 
it's even 501. Mm -hmm. So these figures are, are definitely too high to consider. Yeah. But the, you're including the acquisition cost, mm -hmm. which is not normally figured in there. You might right. figure in soft costs because that's the total. Right, I think hard and soft costs. Yeah. Yes, I, I mean the shift cost for the size, the size of the building is, is also significantly exaggerated. But my, my big concern about this is that building is really massive as compared to surroundings. So if, if uh, my thinking, if, if we want to consider this case like for further alternatives, it should be an office use, they should look at an office use, and, and they should get the building like shorter. So it, it well, the office only has one yeah. FAR, right? So it's only going to be one floor, or maybe uh, two floors. Yes, right? but it, it's, it's much better to like leave the FAR for an office than for a residential. I see. Yeah, I see. Yes, right. and and, and we, right. we've discussed this in other cases mm -hmm. where we mentioned that we do not want to look like we are rezoning the city. Right. So, so I, I would say the, uh, often those conversations are when the whole block is commercial in some way, give or take some scattering of residential, and by us allowing the residential instead of additional floor area for commercial, we're shifting it more towards residential. Here, it's like 100% residential on this block, so I, if, if there were an A, I would be more inclined to say it should be residential, but it should look like all those little houses, right? Mm -hmm. And the thing is, this owner combined two narrow lots to, in a certain way, created the, what do you call it, the D, the D variance, because it be, became, a, became a better lot, right? Um, but those little houses are on 16-foot wide lots, right? And that's the scale that you're talking about. So if the house, if the building were designed to be in character with that little community, it should look like those two little, those little houses. So you're continuing the rhythm. There was a comment from one of the, um, it might have been the community board, that said that this actual area may even be eligible for a historic district designation because of the character of these little houses, and so you wouldn't want this variance to destroy that continuity. I, I think um, I felt like, even though they're not provided financial, and I, without knowing it, I would know like whether an office use or a community facility use would be viable or not. But um, just from the neighborhood context point of view, a residential use is most appropriate and least imposing to the character of this site. And, um, and in terms of the operation, there, um, and, uh, there will be less pedestrian, there will be less traffic, there will be less vehicles coming in and out. It would be just another typical residential use. For that reason, I really felt this use, what they're asking for a use variance, I would be sympathetic. But in terms of the bulk, I agree with the chair that th this has a very unique character, residential character, and if they are proposing the block does, the block does yeah. it should be respect that and try to provide something that is in harmony with that. Well, well, so, but you have to look well, at the FDA yeah, right. and the FDA. So, so you so. can't just make a judgment call right. to me that says, uh, oh, I really think ultimately a house would be best here, so let's buy no, I, I, so B. So no, I also you got to get past A and B. Yes. I, I also think in terms of the uses that are there, that, that most, if you look at the, la the radius map of the land use, most of the larger lots are the ones that have the active manufacturing uses. The smaller ones are either uh, parking lots that are being supported by an adjacent residential use, they're using that as their supporting parking lot, or somebody using it as a temporary parking space as a holdover, which is what this was used for a little bit of a period when the building was demolished. Um, so I. I do appreciate that uh, that residential would make more sense on this block. From a kind of like a, Just a city planning zoning perspective. Completely appreciate that, but right. 
that doesn't make it unique. And and I'm my personal concern is the, the is the fear of what precedent we're going to establish here if we say if we make that a character right. a substantial character in and of itself of uniqueness. Um, we've had other applications before this board that a similar argument could have been made, um, but we were concerned of where that would go. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think that perhaps they may need to go back to the drawing board and find other what other app, uh, arguments they can make for an A. Mm -hmm. um, but this alone in and of itself, I feel would create dangerous precedent. That being said, uh, we, if they do find an A and a B, I do think we run into the trouble of the C and the E, which is trying to keep with the community, and that's with the height, and also with the E is of your smallest, uh, of your uh, minimum variance. Um, I think that uh, other, you know, while I don't think that the the MTA or the argument of the rail line was very very convincing. Uh, if they wanted to make that argument, they should have reached out to the MTA and gotten it. Uh, we actually didn't, didn't include any like MTA survey. Right? Was, no, no, no. There, there is no cost that's coming to no, that construction no, cost because of the. Uh, because of the adjacency to the MTA, and I, I appreciate the honesty on this because I actually did it. The, 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 the site is, is far away from. Yes, it satisfies the DOD requirements for hey guys, go to the, the MTA and just notify them. But when, when you have a site like this, right, right. I, I even I, I recall I had a site in Brooklyn that was like 10 feet away from an elevated railroad bridge. Where that like that subway was like running all the time, and when we started construction at this site, we started with the piece that was 250 feet away from the bridge. Although it was one side, I, I went to the TA and I applied to them, and they said, okay, you got you don't need to get to us because that construction portion we were starting right now is 250 away. When when it comes to the closer part, yes, you need to get our approval on that side. But in, in this case, I don't think they even considered any cost that's coming from the TA adjacency. But I, I, I want to say something like about the, the but use. Before you do that, can we just kind yeah, of sure. I do, do want to. I'm, I'm purposely, I'm purposely not uh, diving into any of the question of the T or whether this is self created hardship. Because I, again, just like the case before us, I think that the first hurdle was the A, and I don't think that has been met yet. Mm -hmm. So if you, it's, for, for me, this side is like the chicken and egg issue. If, if you want to look at this side as manufacturing, it, it, is it unique? Uh, probably. Do you, do you want to build an office? No. You want to build a residential? So why? If, if we if we find if we find a weakness when it comes to the character of the neighborhood, like saying. Oh, this this neighborhood has the Zimbabwean sites. The only site that's not residential is this guy. So it's unique. Let's say we, we get to that conclusion. Now, so what? If we get a residential piece of property like this, located in a residential district, what is, what is the hardship of doing this? Why are you asking for a bulk variance? I understand you may ask for a use variance, but not about it. Well, that, you know, this, that's the way these applications work when residential is not permitted in the district, right? But because residential is not permitted in an M, we automatically, by giving a use variance, look at bulk, right? Because there's nothing to, to, to confine the, the use. So what the board has done in the past is said, look at the closest R district to your site and use that as the basis for your analysis. But often what that does is it gives the applicant way more benefit on their site than any of the not unique property owners on, on the block, right? Everyone else is stuck with one FAR, and, and the applicant for residential gets in a certain way, you could say a windfall. They get windfall. You could say they're getting both the use, which is amazing, mm -hmm. and then they're getting way more FAR than everybody else. So that's why I think it's always appropriate to say, if we make your A finding, 
and, and the B fine. Well, and we're working on the B, then at the very least you should never have more than what everyone else has on the law, on the block. Otherwise, you're benefiting in a way that's un frankly unfair, right? Then everyone else should come for a variance and say, um, you know, I didn't get as much floor area. I'm uniquely stuck at my little height or my little amount of floor area, and I should get what the guy next door got, right? Um, and then you'd be rezoning the area. Yeah, and then totally. Right. And we did have, to put this in perspective, we had, I think it might have been a slightly wider lot, but we just had recently and denied an application for a, a lot that was in this range, but <laughs> definitely bigger than 25 feet. But we were concerned about um, uh, them not establishing that the uniqueness um, drove, that the, yeah, the so-called uniqueness was driving the hardship, right? And then we have another one that we're still working on. So, um, you know, there are ways to argue this. We've also seen really great projects where they've taken advantage of the, um, the, of the width of the site and created great kind of office projects, right? Where a little bit more floor area would get them into something truly excellent. Or maybe not even more floor areas, just creating use of the floor area on the site. Because you don't need to build one story. You can build two or even three if you distribute your floor area nicely on the site and use double height spaces and parking and so on. So, I mean, but it's true that, you know, the M1 districts are in desperate need of a change. In certain areas. In in most. I mean, I'd have to say, if the city's serious about encouraging um, uh, industrial and commercial use in the city and encouraging it to stay, it needs to increase the floor area and all the M1 ones. Oh, okay, thank you. Yes. Yeah. I mean, I'm not saying M15s, they're, they're doing okay. fine, right? But there are not that many of them. Okay. Okay. Item number 5, 2018, 192 BC, 229 Lenox Avenue, Manhattan. This one is Mount Morris Park. Yes. Right? <laughs> okay. And this is a Mount Morris Park Historic District, importantly, because we need LPC in. Um, we have proof of notice appearing to officials and neighbors. We have proof of service of initial application to officials. We don't have a community board recommendation. The applicant submitted a letter saying that they were sent to instead the Mount Morris Park Community Improvement Association, but I would like it to come from um, I will the community board, board, board to okay. us that they don't want to hear it. Um, uh, also, they need to verify that the submission of this application was within the 30 days of the DOD objection dated um, 10, 30, 18, because there's a lot of days between our timestamp and the objection. So I just want to make sure they hit the 30 days. Okay. Yeah, you know, part of the problem is I can't tell when it was actually submitted when I look at the PDFs, mm -hmm. right? Because it gets timestamped when it gets put into submit, which may be days later. Right. Oh, well, if you have this question, we can always go back to the hard copy in the yeah, file. Yeah, but then I'm not in a position to go to the hard copy. Well, you so. can ask the project manager yeah, well, to go. Just, uh, yeah. So I'm asking. I'm asking the project manager to go back to the hard copy. Okay. Okay. So we have a letter of support from Mount Morris Park Development <coughs> Association. We do need LPC sign-off. It's a building in a historic district. They need to provide a firm map, though I don't think it's anywhere in here. They provided a firm. Oh, they did? Yeah. Okay. But you need to locate. You just put a circle okay. at the location so of the okay. site. You either need to provide a legend saying that this circle means the site, or just point to the circle and say site location. Ah, okay. Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure I see a uniqueness argument clearly made here, or a resulting hardship argument. Usually these type of applications are for entire buildings that cannot be converted back to residential use because of rear yard and lot coverage conditions. I'm not sure that that's the case here. I don't under, I'm not saying it isn't, I'm just not sure that it is. I don't understand the as of right plans. Um, how is the fourth floor master bedroom permitted as of right with a 21 foot 10 inch rear yard and no skylights? 
The section through the as of right shows the first floor level rear is a living room with a skylight. The plans show it, it's, it's an art gallery, so which is the as of right? And can the living room skylight meet the light and air requirements? Um, can these new skylights actually be built, increasing the degree of non-compliance? Um, the as of right and proposed actually look the same. The kitchen at the rear on the third floor, the master bed at the rear on the fourth floor, a double height space at the first, second floor, but um, the only difference is it's designated a living room on the proposed instead of a gallery. I'm not really understanding what the need for the variance is. It looks like you could accomplish the need as of right. Um, for example, by merely pulling the new folding doors back in the living room, um, or by providing a skylight at the terrace level. So they, they're removing the rear wall at the first and second floors in the proposed. And then they're installing these 17-foot um, high folding doors, um, which, by the way, requires LPC approval. So you could easily move those doors back into the building, and then you would qualify for, I think DOB would accept that as qualifying for the rear yard. Um, so, and you're already removing the rear wall, so, um, and I don't see why that correction is more costly than what's already proposed. The statement of facts on the answer writer inconsistent and indicate the solutions are otherwise. This needs to be coordinated. Furthermore, the third floor is consistently being shown as a kitchen in all plans. So why does the statement of facts say that the floor needs help on the required light and air? You mechanically ventilate a kitchen. I think actually the plan sets are messed up and there are as of right and existing mixed together. Maybe that's why I can't figure out what's going on. It's really hard to tell. Um, it's a really mess of an application. This lot is 76 feet from the corner. It is not a corner lot. Although for rear yard purposes, it is within 100 feet of the intersection of two streets. So that's a difference. You know, it doesn't become a corner lot because it's within 100 feet of the intersection. It just is within 100 feet for rear yard purposes. So the maximum lot coverage that's allowable is 65% for quality housing. And in, uh, with an open space ratio, if you do height factor, of approximately 17%. So it just depends on which way you go. Um, with uh, respect to the self-created hardship issue, they need to clarify when the footprint was developed that created the non-compliant rear wall conditions. The building was clearly constructed initially as a private residence, but pretty early on converted to other uses. Um, since at least 1912, the additional extension into the rear yard is shown as a one story with a skylight, um, but may have been enlarged to two stories in the 1990s, in which case that part of the hardship arguably might have been self-created. So, um, you know, that's, those are those kinds of things where it just needs to be worked out. It's not that I'm unsympathetic to the problem, but I actually think that there are architectural solutions to this that are not expensive, and so I'm not sure why this needs to be a variance. Um, others? Um, I really did not have any issues with the thing, uh, with the proposal. I think they're, all they're proposing is to maintain the existing building structure um, and composition. And they had stated that um, any changes to the rear would require LPC approval. So I would really they, would like to see um, LPC's review of the proposed project on, on the as of right uh, and the as of right project. Well, so I need to back up. LPC won't look at the as of right. Um, they'll look at a submission for real, but we can't vote on anything without an LPC approval. So what they're proposing to do is remove the entire rear wall at the first and second floors um, and replace that with big folding doors. Mm -hmm. And they're also doing other kinds of changes to the upper floors. So that would have to go through LPC approval mm -hmm. first. So there's something about the uniqueness um, argument that doesn't sit right with me. It's, uh, and I came away from the reading saying, I don't know how unique it is, because what, what about it is unique? Is it the only building or one of the only buildings where the rear wall of the building is 11 feet 9 inches from the rear locker line? Or is it that, unfortunately, this is the one 
of many where somebody decided to try and convert it to residential. Mm -hmm. That was my question, and it's not really addressed. And then if that is the case, then how is that not self-created? So I need more information about both of those findings. Right. And so that self-created would be the looking at the old Sanborns and seeing when that addition was made, mm -hmm. right? But, but uh, I just have a question to pick up with that. So the board has, not, uh, not too long ago we did, um, understood those times where you take a residential building, these 19th century buildings, then it, like a community facility takes over, they go crazy in the backyard, um, and now it's really weird, but the um, owner now goes to DOB and says, I want to convert it to residential, and they say no because you're moving from one section of the zoning resolution to another, and you need to remove all that stuff in the rear, and then we look at it and say, wow, you know, that's a drag, and we should be allowed to, to be able to do this. And the other version of it is, it was built as a house in the 19th century where there were no rules about rear, rear yards. It has a 12-foot rear yard. They never changed anything. It was converted to community facility, and then they want to convert back, and it's not allowed under the way that DOB interprets the zoning right, they lost their non-conforming use status once they switched. So that basically, yes. for non no, 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 non compliant yeah, yeah. status once right. they switch. I mean, I, I agree with you, but this just it it just it seems unfortunate that this would happen. But I just need them to give me a little bit more information about it, I guess, because it does make sense what you're saying. But still, when I came away from it, I was like, okay, like it's just unfortunate. But I don't know if it's worthy of saying this is unique. Mm -hmm. So maybe they could just address it in hearing for me. And just to that point, I'd ask uh, uh, the members of the board, do they, do they feel like this is a variance involving the alteration of a one, two, or three family residence, or is it something else? Because it's not currently a residence. It's not currently only a residence. So you don't need to do a financial hardship evaluation. Oh, no, they don't need. To, no, there isn't a financial analysis being done, right? We're there looking isn't. at this as a one or two family house. It is. It is their, their proposal is, is to convert this to a one family legally. I mean, at the moment, it's not legally a one family. Right. So my, my my question is, does that if the if the original if the CFO is currently not a one or two family, you're altering the CFO that is not a one or two family into a one or two family, or a, a, a one, two, three, or one, two, or three. It's family. really a one, one family in this case, right? So, so were you saying that they shouldn't? Perhaps they, they should provide a financial hardship argument. No, so, it, so sometimes they'll talk about it's going to cost us too much money to do the work, which is a different thing than a financial hardship that we can't make a reasonable return on the investment. So it's two different things, right? For houses, we don't ask for a financial analysis of reasonable return, but the owner might say to us, oh my God, it's going to cost me half a million dollars to pull off this whole rear facade, and otherwise I could just have this thing that's been like this since 1912. But I have to say, in yeah. support of what um, Shibeta said, Commissioner Shibeta. No, I'm sorry. not going to be the one. Good, <laughs> good. <No. laughs> when we have had um, industrial use, where we've got a use variance to a residential one-family home in an M1, we have asked them to provide a half a financial. One that basically um, says the as of right industrial use would not work here. Oh, oh and I so see. therefore, yes. we're going to suggest a one family home. So they don't have to do the financial for the one family, but they do have to do the financial to show that the industrial won't work. I see. But in this case it's different because residential is permitted as of right. But they do have two commercial they, they do have commercial floors there. Well the zoning does allow it's a it has a commercial overlay. So you the 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 lower floor is commercial and the upper floor is residential, which is actually a question I have because it has a commercial overlay. And it's going to be converted to all residential. Um, so, aren't you required to have uh, commercial use on the ground floor? I don't believe so, but then maybe. So it depends on what zoning district it is. Um, mm -hmm. right, right. So I if it's one of the high districts, it's yeah. C one four. So, so probably not. Oh, right. Yeah. So um, let me check that clearly. 
and we don't want to have the non-commercial art gallery there anymore, right? Which is a community facility use, right? Oh, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. So. Mm -hmm. Okay, I, I just have one one remaining point. I I did get the feeling that, especially reading through the statement of facts, page six, the existing conditions, I got the feeling that they are arguing the existing conditions as a reason for their hardship. And, and this opened the door big for like, the county arguing, isn't this a self-created? The existing conditions, somebody created them. So could this be a self-created hardship? Mm -hmm. So I, I mean, they need to take a look at that, like the way it was phrased there and probably rephrase it. Mm -hmm. I think that's what a, a few yeah. commissioners yeah. are saying. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because most of this is about them having added that little structure. Yeah. So it's it's likely that the 21 foot depth was how the building was built in the late 19th century as this kind of Queen Anne style building. And so that would be the most similar to what we've seen before where it was built as a house, it gets converted to community facility, and now all I want to do is use it as a house again and DOP won't let me, right? Um, as opposed to the additional portion that was one story in 1912, but I think became two stories in 1980-something. Um, and so now they're saying we can't make this a legal room. Um, and so, you know, did you create a hardship? Because they're asking for an 11-foot rear yard, right? And so, should they let, is the 11 foot rear yard the right thing to do, kind of, as opposed to the 20 foot rear yard? And that's why I'm saying you could probably fix it, pull it back to 11 without a lot of expense, just slide the doors back. Um, anyway, okay. Item number 6, 2019 48 BC, 3145 41st Street, Queens. Uh, we have proof of notice of hearing to officials and neighbors and proof of service of initial application to officials, but I didn't find the community board recommendation. Okay. Um, they need to provide proof of separate and individual ownership since prior to 1961. Um, the unique, uniqueness argument hinges on the contention that no other house on a similarly sized lot in the study area has side yards. No map was provided to support that the chart in the statement of facts. So there was a chart that says no side yards, but they didn't provide any map to support that. Um, they also need a study of the widths of the houses and yards in the study area, which actually should be 1,000 feet, not 400 feet. Um, the as of right should show what in addition to the existing back building would look like, um, just because you've got an existing building there that's a non-complying, non-conforming structure. Um, could you add to it? Um, and if you can, then they should show what that is, um, even if it's just a sketch, because it may be nothing. Um, all drawings, they need to show the abutting building and the proposed um, compliance with the abutting building rule, uh, section 23-49. There's a rule about how much of the building has to abut the abutting building, um, and how much of a whatever, the percentage of shared walls. They have to show that that complies. They should show on the title box which is existing, which is proposed, and which is a, the as of right drawing. It's very hard to figure out which one I was supposed to be looking at. Um, they said there's 100 square feet not counted as floor area in the R5. I would like to know what that is from. Um, I never heard of that. Um, and I'd like to know why couldn't a semi-attached two-family with a shallower side yard work resulting in, say, a 16-foot wide building instead of this full width property with building. And they should show the building in the context of the neighborhood. We've had a few of these applications where they ask for the fall width, and then we find out that shallow, narrower buildings are typical in the neighborhood, and so um, there should be at least some side yard provided. So that's where on this one. Um, I have a question um, if this site qualifies for predominantly built up or not. Um, and that's just a, 
Uh, the question I have, and if they have to, can just clarify because that allows for 1.65. That they are not saying they shouldn't go for that. I just kind of wanted to know that. Yes. Um, shouldn't uh, also a waiver of the side yard be required pursuant to section 23-461? Um, and the zoning sh chart should also show the side yard requirement pursuant to that zoning regulation. Um, I have Sorry, to say they are requesting a side yard waiver. But it's for a different section. They are requesting it under 23-49, which is a special provision for side lot line windows, which is, uh, oh, right, um, yeah. I see what you're saying. Yeah, 461. No, I think I went through this exercise and found out why they were Why they don't need to? Okay. It says, attached to family to with minimum eight foot side yard was, um, no, I can't remember. Okay, never mind, leave, leave that there. Okay, go ahead. And um, the zoning chart has incorrect existing and open space and lot coverage uh, analysis. Um, in terms of the ask, um, the ex uh, the uniqueness is um, that um, they're proposing a non um, a three-story residential building, uh, right? Uh, Two-family, 1.25 FAR. So it definitely meets the FAR requirement. The only way is the is the uh, side yard. Um, Sorry, you were saying in terms of uniqueness. In terms of uniqueness, what? So in terms of uniqueness, this site um, compared to the other buildings which were built pre-61, many of them don't have the side yard requirements of the underlying current zoning. So I think they need to go through the unit and analysis in a little bit more detail to show how many of these existing buildings are pre-61 and therefore do not qualify, or these are detached homes, again, pre-61, many of them don't provide the required uh, side yard requirements. Uh, this is to establish the uniqueness uh, for them. Um, I, I think, um, I, again, I, I think the problem ask is reasonable and um, in terms of the uniqueness I'm convinced and uh, uh, I just want them to provide these supporting documents in terms of the density and everything. It all seems reasonable to me. I agree with you as to the minimal finding. We need to know the average width of the street wall of adjacent homes or homes in the study area to determine what the appropriate width and if the side yard should be provided of some sort. And what about uniqueness? Um, I mean, I think that they, they gave us some kind of a study that basically shows that the other homes that are 24 feet or less in width don't provide side yards. I guess I'm there. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think the issue with this is you get to build an 8-foot wide house. Right. So, well, or a 13-foot wide house if you're allowed to attach right. to the right. 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 yeah. but And that's not marketable. Mm -hmm. right. I, I believe that since this is this is a variance case, and, and they, I don't know why they like when they compare it with other houses that they don't have the, uh, side yards. They, they use the 24 feet wide case. If if I'm not sure if 24 feet is is coming from somewhere, but if you look at the same with 21 foot wide lot, you will get only six lots, and the majority of them we have significantly less floor area. So it sounds like they are burdened by smaller floor area that they got. Well, so we're not asking for floor area. No, no, I'm, 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 I'm not, yes, they are not, but they, they, they are claiming like this is like a very common case in that neighborhood. The, you got 34 other lots resume side yard. That's what they are saying actually. But they are using the magic number here is 24 feet wide. But what I'm saying is if you look at 21 foot wide lots, which is the case for the side, you will just get six yeah, other lots. And, and, and so, well, I, I would say when I'm looking at the area map and there are lots across, right on 41st Street that are on 20 foot wide lots, but these are all attached homes, so none of them are providing any side yards. So if, if you look at 20 or less. So, I, well, I'm, I'm, so 
I, I actually like the way they did this study because rather than, oftentimes we, we get this. It's a 21 foot wide, so I'm not going to look at anything that's 21 feet or greater. Mm -hmm. So they show us 19 foot 4.4 and less. And so it's leaving out the 22 foot lots that are almost exactly the same. And so it sort of skews the study to be too specific. And meanwhile, you can find some others that are um, equally burdened and that will weaken your argument. Here, actually, I think the approach is very honest by going to 25 foot wide. They say, look, even among the much wider lots than I have, we, we have this problem. So, um, and, and so if you were to cull it down to something that's even narrower, then I don't know. Well, what about the lots that are a little bit bigger? Maybe not in this particular case, but I like the idea of going to a range that's a little bit higher than what is the situation here, and then you can decide for yourself, how, and they can on their own chart say, of the 25 foot, of all the lots 25 and under this. And then you can add another line that says, of all the lots 21 foot, and under that, right? But to, I like that they include all of them, and then you can deduct from your own. That's, that's fair enough. Yeah. yeah I, I get it. OK. And you I'm going to add to this. OK, item number 7, 2-10BZ, and 2019-193BZ. This is 218-222, Second Avenue, also known as 311, 315 East 13, 310 East 14th Street, and um, 300 East 14th, 26 East 14th, 313 East 13th Street, Manhattan. This is the enlargement of the New York Eye and Ear for, um, Infirmary. Okay, we have proof of notice of hearing to officials and neighbors, um, which is not in the main folder. So I'd like a copy put in the main folder. It's in the folder for 2019-193 BZ. You could just copy it and move it, have a copy put in um, the folder for the other case. And there's two cases, right? Uh, one of the other case is the uh, 2 10 BZ. Okay. Um, and then uh, community board recommends approval with um, what they say is strong re reservations, quote unquote. Community board three recommends to approve the new Mount Sinai Beth Israel Hospital facility with reservations about minimal backyard clearance between some residential buildings on East 14th Street and strongly encourages. Um, the hospital to reach out to those buildings and discuss this issue with the residents and other buildings nearby the ER, the emergency entrance, to address the ambulance noise issues, um, which are really, I think, very good points raised by the community board. Uh, for me, this is always what I like to call the milk and cookie hour, um, to know that they've already uh, responded to community concerns. My, largely in the ambulance impact. Um, we have one letter in support. I'd like to know the status on the CPC certification for transit volume and revocable consent. On the Cornell Educational Facility deference discussion, they need to provide detailed information on the interface between the seventh floor education center in the north building and the rest of the complex that is subject to the variance. Um, the pro because it's really the north building that has the educational use, not the new building. Um, the program elements related to the education center look small compared to the 400 interns who would be trained there. So I just think they didn't get into enough depth about this subject. Uh, normally we learn how the internship programs work. You know, they meet in different dispersed places of the hospital, but interns work absolutely everywhere in the hospital. They, you know, have they follow doctors into the ORs and all of that sort of stuff. And I didn't get them pulling that information from the North Building about the North Building's activity into the new building. Except for when they talk about they needed the patient rooms large enough for yes for the students to, to be standing there. there. To yeah. be standing there. Mm -hmm. Okay. So maybe more of yeah. on that because 
though they were trying to make a uniqueness argument also, I think the uniqueness argument is not very strong, and so really it would be the deference position that they should be taking. And what I, I think is important is this is a teaching hospital that has its own medical uh, its own medical school built in, but they, they sort of didn't underscore it. I mean, yeah. for me, I'm a new building. Well, they could, also, they could provide information about, well, we use the, this amount of residents and this amount of medical students usually accompany the doctors to each bedside, and therefore you need patient rooms that are this square feet, you know, yeah. minimum, mm -hmm. to accommodate everybody, faculty right. health. To the bedsides, and because it's not just a bed hospital, to the ORs. To I mean, that's really what actually the students do. They're really everywhere. Over there. So, um, and I think perhaps it wasn't so beefed up because they were relying in large extent on the, on their clean uniqueness. But I, I think if they were just there, we'd have a hard time with this. Um, the statement of facts on page 21 states that small offices and conference rooms would be eliminated by the res renovations, but the South Building is almost entirely small exam rooms and offices. I want them to explain that. So a lot of my comments are about reading their programmatic needs analysis, which is really mostly in the statement of facts, and then looking at the drawings and saying, huh, you just said that, but I don't see that. And um, trying to figure out how the building actually does what they say it's doing. And sometimes, you know, when we've done this, we've, been, we've ended up improving the design because the owner doesn't even realize it's not making the connection that they thought was made, or maybe the drawings are old, and since then the architects have changed the layout. Um, statement of facts indicates that the site is subject to mandatory inclusionary housing requirement, but I don't think that's correct. That's just a sort of the general zoning analysis. I don't think that's correct. The discussion of the history of the Beth Israel Mount Sinai sites um, don't um, mention that the plan is to sell the 16th Street and 1st Avenue building after completion of the subject property, which is widely known, but it's, I have a note from the New York Times in 2016. Um, they need to clarify uh, all the elevations on the plants and sections stated in NAVD 88 or are some measured off of base plane. So the times when I'm not sure which height I'm looking at, so I want to make sure that's clear. They should show the outlines of buildings on the out parcels in, in section and on uh, drawing Z-106 so we can really understand the relationship of the very large incursion on those neighbors. Um, there are these little eight-foot wings on drawing Z-105 in the rear yard equivalent behind lot 20. What are, where are they? Um, and you should clarify on the drawings the waivers that were permitted under prior BSA special permit actions, so some kind of different hatching or something like that. Um, I also noted that the, the plans that ultimately are the BSA set are not nearly as detailed as some of the drawings that are provided as backup material. And that's what makes it a little, maybe, not, maybe therefore my comments maybe a little surprising because when, when you go look in some of the backup, there's a drawing that's super detailed that shows like every chair and all of that. And so, but that information isn't on the set of drawings that's ultimately the BSA set. So it might help this review if we had the same level of detail on the two sets uh, on all the drawings so that we're looking consistently at a, at a common set because it, it's pretty confusing. You, you look and you don't find and then you finally, you know, three hours later you find this one drawing stapled to the back of another um, article or something else that's dealing with another issue. Um, they should dimension the setbacks on the plans and sections. Um, it's not clear at all what those are. Um, so both the front and the rear setbacks. They need to show on the plans and sections the location of the MTA easement and the anticipated response to it, um, you know, which is to provide an elevator, escalator, stairs, and so on. My own experience, and I've done these projects that are subject to the MTA transit easement, 
is that the easement does not preclude productive use of the area above the easement and of course allows for building structure to create a cellar level to access the subway and so on, which is one of the things they say they're not allowed to do. It's not correct. They allow you to build the building, but you have to accommodate the elevators and the stairs and you work with the TA to figure out where the stairs are going to enter from and how or if there's going to be an elevator on your side or maybe that's going to be across the street and so on. Um, so uh, I, I don't find a copy of an easement recorded against lot 7 or a copy in the folder. I doubt there is one. If this has already been negotiated with MTA and city planning, they should provide this. I know, the, the as I say, the site falls within the Special Transit Land Use District of Section 95-03. 031 table B at this location, which is specific in the section of the zoning resolution. The types of easements are diagrammed in the resolution and permit development above the easement area. So the statements in the statement of fact that the corner cannot be developed are inaccurate. So, you know, it doesn't mean, so, so they use the statement that when they demolish the little optics building, they can't use that site for anything because they're not allowed to because of the easement. That's totally incorrect. Now the next question though is, could they use that site for anything? Like, what's the point of expanding the North Building? What does it get you? What it might get you, for example, is a place to put mechanical equipment, which they already have, if I understand correctly, on that little optics building. So if they, you know, that might be an option. At the same time, I understand that they want to have this sort of welcoming plaza. Um, but then they shouldn't be so, they shouldn't be disingenuous about the reason for doing it. If you're demolishing the whole building and you want to welcome in plaza, that's different than saying we can't build there, which is not the case. Um, I, in terms of, there's a drawing Z-107 where they try to show what the required um, waivers are. It seems like they're saying waivers are needed with respect to street wall location and minimum base height for the existing conditions, which makes no sense because those are existing non-compliant conditions. Um, the studies really should only be about the new building or additions to the existing buildings, like when you remove the little optics building then there's going to be some kind of a overhang thing that probably needs a waiver because they're not building to the street line. Um, it's unclear from the drawing which portions are new non-compliances or increases in non-compliance. They should make clear uh, that clear for all the facades and the plans um, and all the sections. The little lot seven work um, may need a waiver, as I said. Um, but what about the wrap around the corner element? Um, that may actually decrease the degree of existing non-compliance of the north building. So it wouldn't need a waiver because it's decreasing the degree of non-compliance. Um, is and is, I don't didn't really understand if the facade of the north building is being reclad or they're leaving it alone. Um, no mechanical equipment, I just want to note, should be located behind the out parcels in the rear yard equivalent portion. I would want to make that a condition. Um, none is currently shown, but I think that it shouldn't be shown. If I understand correctly, the cellar and groundwater condition here are limited to about 12 feet below grade, so there is only one level available for mechanical equipment in the cellar. The site is not in floodplain. Um, but we know from another site that we looked at where the water table is high-ish, so it makes sense not to be pushing this on the mechanicals. Um, but they should look, um, though, to putting more equipment, mechanical equipment, on the roof of the north building or on the roof of the lot 20 building that is lower than the maximum building height for C16A. Also, the geotech report indicates that groundwater conditions are better on lot 20, so, and there's no cellar being shown on lot 20. Um, so, 
um, why not receive more mechanical equipment. The reason I keep talking about mechanicals is I actually think that the mechanical is very high on this mid-block building. I know the building is the same height as the 14th Street building or somewhere along there, but this is a mid-block building and what's making it so tall is the mechanical floor. And it seems like there are other places to put mechanical, so why not do that? Um, also, uh, they should provide a more detailed analysis of how the mechanical systems will be upgraded and integrated among the three buildings. The drawings indicate that several floors of the north building will essentially be gut renovated, so clearly there will be mechanical upgrades and improved efficiencies with them. Um, given uses that are penetrating the 15-foot setback from 13th Street, um, namely mechanical, those, sh those floors should be pulled back to open the street up to more light, um, so I don't see why they can have 15-foot setbacks at that level. Um, um, by the way, I'm just going to point out that the zoning diagrams that were provided by the architect to explain the way through uh, issues were extremely helpful um, in understanding the project and the waivers. Um, I'd also like, though, a diagram to clarify the amount of floor area permitted to be used on each side of the district boundary line and from and to where it is proposed to be transferred and what the resulting FAR would be on each side of the boundary line. The way they're treating this request to move the floor area from the higher district to the lower district is by saying um, they're requesting a waiver on um, the right to transfer floor area um, across district boundaries, but the real effect of it is you're asking for an increase in floor area in the district that doesn't permit so much floor area, so you should be able to see what that is. And because this site um, is not a pre-61 zoning lot, you can't treat it as a blended floor area. You have to look at one on each side, so they shouldn't be treating it as though blended. Um, and that's pursuant to Article 7. Say, say again? That's pursuant to Article 7. Yeah, exactly. So they're, they're just saying, look, we have all this floor area on the site, just let us put it over here. But in fact, no, you're increasing the floor area in the C16A, and we should see what that is. Um, so I'd like to also understand why was it decided not to have a connection between the new and the north buildings except at the first and second floors. Um, that I question why doesn't that make it more difficult to integrate care that may be offered in the north building. For example, the statement of facts at page 20 states that the pathology lab on the third floor will serve both north and new buildings but there isn't a connection at the third floor. So how is doing that, quote, reducing staff travel distance and, quote, serving the full hospital campus? Also, the statement of fact states that the comprehensive psychiatric emergency unit on the ninth floor must have direct elevator access from the emergency department. Yet the only elevator access from that unit is shared with all of the other patients and forces the patient to enter into the main lobby before going into the emergency department, and there's no access to the new building's elevator bank. And so, um, you know, I'm imagining why you would need to quickly go to emergency from the ninth floor unit. I would think you don't want this person to be interacting with patients who are just sitting in the general waiting room. And so I don't get why there's no direct access or a separate elevator or something. Also, just curious, um, this is really is curiosity, why are extremely acute infectious disease patients in the non-acute portion of the emergency department mingled with average types of emergency department treatment rooms? One of the reasons I ask that is the acute infectious disease that's referred to there are the ones that Department of Buildings was concerned about um, transmitting in the, the medical waste facility. And um, here you are in a low-density residential commercial district um, receiving patients who actually potentially have these issues. And we don't know where the medical waste is going, by the way. <laughs> so um, I, I was curious, that's more of a curiosity, why you would put them in that location. 
I only see uh, also a first floor connection through the cafe to the south building from the north building, which seems like quite a strange way to connect from the two buildings, and none from the new building, um, uh, sorry, to, from the north building, and none from the new building to the south building, although the statement of fact states there are connections from both. Um, perhaps I'm also not understanding the functions of the north and south buildings and why the new building isn't duplicating program or not taking advantage of existing program space in the existing buildings. Um, I, just because there's just not that much connection between them. One of the reasons that I keep asking about this is because um, the fact that they're not building much in that rear yard equivalent between the north and the south and the new building that is all backing up where you could pull away in position on the neighbors by um, putting more stuff in the rear yard equivalent between the north and south building and they're not doing it and um, and it, it seems like the rationale for not doing it I'm not really persuaded. Um, they also need to explain more about the length of stay in the Statement of Facts on page 24. Earlier in the Statement of Facts it says that sleep studies will now be done at home, but on this page it says the stay is 12 hours. Also what is meant by, quote, an average inpatient census of two to three patients and outpatient census of 700 patients. I didn't understand that. Um, all of these questions, again, stem from my concern about the height of the new building and the underutilization of the Lot 20 building um, and the rear yard space between the north and south building, the increase in usage of which would not impact the community and could reduce the impact of the new building on the community. Um, I, I hear the comments about what they say in, in, in advanced defense of this about relocating the air handler and exhaust fan, but I frankly don't understand that. Air handlers and fans break down and are replaced eventually. How would that be done? This, these are located in the space in that rear yard equivalent between the north and south building. Why couldn't mechanical equipment in the new building or on the new building lot temporarily take over for relocation. And also a diagram that I find later that's about the rear yard equivalent um, shows that same mechanical equipment to be installed, not existing. So the argument about not being able to move it seems disingenuous or incorrect. Um, I'm sorry, I do have a lot of comments. And, um, and why, um, and then they're saying a cantilever would be needed to build there. I don't understand why a cantilever would be needed. Structure would attach to the new and existing buildings. Um, I'm suggesting this to accommodate more mechanical equipment so the supporting structure could just be an open frame. It doesn't have to be a building. I'm having trouble also with the idea, so this is um, another one of the variance requests, of a variance for illuminated signs. How does that fall into the Cornell Doctrine Programmatic Needs argument? What do the signs say and why can't they comply with C-17A and 6A regulations for non-illuminated or indirectly illuminated signs and banners or a combination of all permitted? Here, these are corner and through lots, so it can really add up, just not to 2,500 square feet and one at the top of the building. Um, the signage report that was provided doesn't break down the signage calculations by frontage and so on, so we don't actually even know what they are. Also, in my experience, as I said in the earlier uh, hearing today, POB doesn't count certain safety-related essential hospital signs towards maximum area, such as those that say ambulance, loading dock, emergency, and also banners on hospitals are permitted to be any size without limitation, and their materials are not specified in the zoning resolution. Um, I'd like to know what other hospitals have done to avoid the need for a variance. I only know one variance for a hospital sign. Um, and doesn't the north building already have a sign mounted higher than is normally permitted? And if you just want to change the sign, it's probably grandparented. Um, and, and then um, elevations of the proposed should show all of the materials. Um, renderings are appropriate in this case for community information. I, I assume I'll have community um, speaking here. 
Um, I'd like to know what the materials for the Lot 20 mechanical building facade is. They describe it as a screen, which I don't think would be okay because a screen means everyone's looking at the mechanical equipment. Um, what about the noise and vibration that's generated by this mechanical building? Um, and I just wanted to um, alert DEP though they may have given us a noise sign off, I don't think they realize that that's an entire mechanical building um, and that the proposal is to screen it and then close it in a building with these um, I don't think we have a sign off yet. Okay. So I have, I have a DEP sign off on air quality, but open questions on noise. So air quality would be the same. So they're, they're showing screens because you get better ventilation through a building that's screened, but what comes in goes out, and you've got residential tenant neighbors right there. Um, so I'd like them to be alerted to that proposal. There are DEP comments prior to sign off on the phase two work plan and HASP. Um, I don't see LPC's acknowledgement of the project's potential for impact on the south building. Um, but we do have shadows in archaeology sign off. Um, and we need DOT review. This is very important of the traffic, pedestrian, and parking impacts, especially with respect to the emergency room and ambulance entry on 13th Street. I actually thought at one point um, there was a study about providing a special lane for the ambulance, and that wasn't discussed anywhere in the BAS. Um, and also, they're proposing a ramp on the 14th Street sidewalk to get into the north building. Um, 14th Street is maybe not on the day they did their study, but it's often so crowded you can barely fit on it. Um, I would say it's more like on, on weekends. And so there's this ramp in the way, this very busy sidewalk. I And since there's the gut renovating that area, why don't they just put the transition inside the building? It's only three steps, so I don't agree that there should be a ramp on 14th Street. Sorry, those are my comments. <laughs> um, the application was very thorough. Um, it was a lot of information to go through, and obviously I haven't had the chance to review everything. Mm -hmm. um, so I will reserve my comments for tomorrow. Okay. But I think one thing I did um, notice in terms of the signage, and I was looking at the sign um, um, proposals and looking at the context. And given that this is a high-density neighborhood with a lot of tall buildings and locations of the signage that they're proposing, it's, um, and I think this is what I I would differ from you on this, is that I thought they were reasonable in terms of the location uh, of the heights uh, because they want to make sure it's visible for the ambulates uh, that are from all and anyone who's coming to the site and and uh, and it's not only visible from, second, you know, from uptown but also from downtown and across town. So, um, the, and there are existing signs, they're improving the signage. Can they be less illuminated? And can we use a different technology to make it more visible? I will be for that. Um, but that is of my comments, brother. Okay. I have no questions on this case. Okay. <laughs> okay, I, I'll talk about uh, two things. The first thing is the uh, the drawings. I, I couldn't see any sections of the proposed drawings for the building. Hmm? Uh, yes, I'm looking at proposed BSA proposed plans. I, uh, other than the sections at the beginning, they are very schematic. I don't see like any theme section. Oh no, there are no detail. That's correct. Yeah. So this is this is one thing. The other thing I, I'm just talking about the uh, adding some other seller, additional seller for the mechanicals. Uh, I, I looking at the geotech and attachment G, at glance I would say yes, if you want to add a whole seller covering the entire footprint, that would require like significant reopening, which could be a concern for the adjacent buildings. But if I, I have two other approaches that I believe they need to look into. When you 
say a second seller, not they're already putting in one. There, there is one. Yeah, so you say the, the, the of, and the, that's what we said. If, if you're going to ask us for another one, we're going to be in the water, it's going to, I believe, what they are talking about is construction cost. It's going to be significant to put uh, a monitoring system that's capable of making them work in dry conditions. And I agree with that. Uh, but the increase, I'll just talk about adding a seller over the entire footprint with, with some cost manifesting approach. If, if you think of adding another seller over the entire footprint. You mean under the existing buildings? Yes, if you are if you, if you put another seller, put new foundation system, let's, let's say it's a mad foundation, put new mad foundation in. And, and benefit from the hydrostatic pressure holding up the building. This is going to be like a boat. Usually the concern when, when, you, um, when you put a building like that is, is two things. The soil building pressure and the construction cost associated with the excavation and the, uh, the demotor. Right now we are talking about deep foundation system I believe it's case in the system, it, and, and just one seller avoiding the, um, the need for significant uh, dewatering system. If it, so they are paying on the foundation side for the foundation, but they are saving on the dewatering side because they don't need to go deep into the water. If you switch, if you pay more on the dewatering and save on the foundation by switching from deep foundation to mad foundation, which is for sure significantly uh, less costly than, than deep foundations. But if you get away with that, you need to pay some more on the deep water. So you will need to install like um, a water type system all around to, to make sure that water is not going to seep into your excavation. It's, it's an approach. I, they didn't talk about it. If, if they looked at it and they believe it's, it's infeasible, I'm okay with that. But I need to give feedback on it. So what, what would it get us? That, my question it is... It get us to... We're going to have another seller with the same... Oh, oh so that system. would allow a second seller. Yeah, you save on the foundation goes, oh, and what right. you say you pay on the water, mm -hmm. but with that comes... Mm -hmm. You got another seller. You can put them in. So, so the thing is, though, as we watched New York Presbyterian Hospital after Sandy, they were wrecked for I don't know how many months, where they had um, their mechanicals in something that was below flood level. Right? They're not not in flood zone, but they got hit by Sandy so badly because things were so subterranean. So the tr the trend now with all hospitals is to have as little mechanicals in the cellar as possible. We'll probably do that. Yeah. So 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 that's the thing is because obviously we don't want hospitals to be out of commission after a storm. Yeah. Um, so so I I get why they're moving as much of the equipment as they can above grade um, to avoid the problem that New York Presbyterian or maybe. They could argue that way. But the other approach I think mm -hmm. they could adapt is you don't want to spend too much on the new auto. You could achieve that. This site is, is huge. It's, it's 200 plus by 355. Instead of like digging the entire site, you could come to the middle portion of the site and probably dig a smaller footprint where you can like shield this area and, and add another server and probably build a strong room around this area to make sure that water is not going to come to this area, whatever happens. Mm -hmm. This is this is like an, an, another option to look into and the, the water cost for that wouldn't be significant at all. Mm -hmm. Isn't part of their programmatic need not to disrupt any of the operations in the existing yes. buildings? If we're mm -hmm. digging down to put another yes. cellar, mm -hmm. we'll do that. Yes. yes. Aren't you talking about just under the new building, or you're saying yes. under the whole yes. cellar? No, no, no. You said no, no, no. Under, under, I'm talking about under the new building. Under uh, the new building. Okay. Yes. Okay. Just, just pick a few. 
I'm not sure if the mechanical is going to require them to, to like use the entire space of, of the building, the entire footprint of the building. Let's say the mechanical requires 20% of the footprint. So instead of locating this 20% close to the boundaries, come to the central portion of the building oh, and, and dig an area. In this case, you're far away from the neighbors, you're far away from the perimeter. So you're going to have to worry about moving buildings and these kind of, like, say, start building constructions. And, and just put a cut of wood, a watertight SOE system, and dig this area and build a watertight foundation and, 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 and then if you, you got it. And the cost that's associated with this is, is going to be, like, Feasible. So, so in this case, um, because we're not looking at costs, right? We don't do that analysis for, with them because it's a it's a not for profit. We don't do a cost analysis. But so, what you're this is more of your why don't you take a look at this? You might save money. It's kind of like that. Is that what you're saying? It is, and and the I believe they are arguing cost wise because they are saying if we add another seller, that this is this is. Um, yeah. This is the way we, that's why he presented us with Appendix G. They are saying, if we, if you're going to push us to put another seller, mm -hmm. we can't do that because the ground order is, uh -huh. and by the way, too, regarding the ground order thing, you, you think uh, that if the ground order is, is shallow at a location and it's deep at another location, you can't build it, you know. Once you open the side, it's like, yes, it's, it, yeah, yeah, I think yeah, it's a yeah, question yeah, that's all. Also, sub seller and re, just rearrange the circulation space and make it impossible to to actually meet that, get down to that sub seller because right now the elevators and the staircases are on the outside of that new building. Mm -hmm. And if you now sink a cellar, a partial cellar, into the central part of that footprint, mm -hmm. How are you going to get to it? I, I think the commissioner Shaka and, 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 and uh, uh, chair, the chair uh, both just gave suggestions on how to make the most useful utility out of the site. And I think it's up to the applicant to see whether or not that works for them. I, I'm not sure that, mm -hmm. you know, and they... No, I understand that, yeah. but I do also want to give, I, I tend to give deference, sure. active mm -hmm. deference to hospitals and to schools when they talk about their program rather than questioning and nitpicking every single little design choice they make because they do yes occasionally you can redesign something for them but they generally have thought this out over months if not months then years and so to, to then have them do this exercise of well i think you could put a cellar in and you're saying you're having water problems well i think you could put a small cellar in so that then they could then come here and give us extra drawings that show if we put a small cellar in here that's watertight, we're going to have to rearrange our circulation space in our rooms because on the cellar floor, you can see that the elevators and the staircases are on the outer side of the building. How would you get to this cellar? If it's just a small portion of the center. They're actually in the, I think what he's saying is the center, they're not on the perimeter of, they're not on the front of the building or in the rear of the building. They're in the center of excavated area. So it actually would work, but my interest in the mechanicals is I think the building is too tall. And when you look at mechanicals and you've seen that they can be put in other places, that's why I was, um, picking the program because they're they're claiming they need certain things and then they're not providing the things and so and they could provide the things for instance they're saying they want the contiguity between the north and the south building the north and the new building but then they don't provide it and I'm like well why don't you provide it as, as if they're staying away from adding any more structure in the rear yard equivalent um, because they think they shouldn't. Right. And I'm like, no, come to us and ask for a bridge that connects the north building and the new building. If you want your PACU or your um, the psychiatric ward to connect to the emergency floor where there's an elevator right there, then put a bridge, right? So uh, what I'm trying to do is say, don't be shy. Ask for more things if you think you need the connections. But while you're at it, move some mechanical equipment, if feasible, into that rear yard equivalent be between the north and the south building so that we can lower the height of the mechanical that's on top of the new building. 
Well, that's different than a request of an exercise to put a small cellar, sub-cellar, underneath the cellar. Mm -hmm. But I think that's going to the same question, ultimately. It's like, so I wasn't going for adding more mechanical in the cellar because I do remember the disaster that happened at the hospital uptown and the idea that the bathtub actually works. I don't know because we have not Unfortunately, we haven't had to test whether the bathtub really works to not shut down a hospital. But I, I prefer the idea that the hospitals keep the mechanical equipment above likely flood levels, right? Especially in this area where we know that there's underground streams and everything like this. this I mean, a lot of this is landfill here, right? Yeah. So, so that that's kind of thing. I, I, I'm not anxious to force them to go looking at a sub cellar. I'm, I'm not. I'm yeah. not forcing them, and I'm not denying them a variance. I'm not saying don't give them a variance. What I'm saying is, in previous cases, including schools, by the way, we looked that when when it comes to the fact that the requested variance is, 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 could be reduced or added another seven or partial seven could reduce the scope of the variance. We did ask previous applicants to go and investigate this, and I think that was a school in, in Manhattan too. Yeah, yeah. What I'm saying here, it's, it's no difference from, from that case. I'm, I'm sympathetic with them. I know that they are non-profit. And, and they didn't put the argument in front of us mm -hmm. to say we can't go that route because of such and such. So what I'm saying is, I, I thought about what you submitted. I believe you, you might have another way to look at it. If you want to look at it, you might just can do it. And, and that's, that's all. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. We're done? Anybody else? No, no, right I don't have anything more to add. Okay. Okay, this concludes the public review session for December 9, 2019. Don't make plans for tomorrow night. So, yeah, I'm going to be up at 3.30 tomorrow. Yeah, I still want all the kids to go to sleep. Yeah.